right? In theory, live on the internet, if it's if if it is to be believed. Uh, for those of you who are watching already, that's great. I see some comments in the chat, but things are catching up right now. It looks like nobody is. Uh, with me today, I have Kyle to I believe my my right. Alien Tude, his channel is linked in the description down below, uh, as well as Kane Chen, who is to his right, and again, a uh, link to channel in the description down below. Uh, we have gone through and done a tier maker list, which looks something if, uh, if it works like this, this thing. We all went through, we talked about the brands, we put them in various tiers, elaborated and gave our thoughts, some more eloquently and diligently than others. Um, Kane, Kane wrote a novel, uh, so if you if you want when you're done making it through War and Peace, uh, check out <laughs> check out Kane's video. Um, and then I also put up this community tab, or I, I put in my community tab a link to this live thing that's going on now. There's 14 more hours to go, and put things in buckets if you uh, would like to participate yourself and contribute. It looks like 17 folks have gone through and voted. If uh, if I understand how that works correctly, but we'll maybe come back to that later, and uh, I will I will stick to just some thoughts. So we're gonna we're gonna go through and talk a little bit about where we were similar, where we were different, our approaches, and that kind of stuff. And uh, Kane and Kyle are probably better at chat than I am, so apologies as always in advance for sucking and ignoring. Sucking at chat and ignoring all of the comments. I should not just do a Shatner pause after I say the word sucking. Um, Okie doke. Yes, that's the plan. Enough context on on with, with the, the show. Um, so maybe first, guys, I thought before we get into the results, just our approach to doing this list. Uh, we all had something a little bit different in mind. When you were going through and evaluating things in tiers. I know I, I did it from the standpoint of like my general perception of value. Uh, were you thinking about it the same way or or differently? What were your thoughts? I think I'll go first. Uh, my thoughts were to base it purely on my own experience uh, with, with the swords, not to do anything based on other people's or impressions from uh, just browsing their products, anything like that. I wanted it to be purely based on my own experience and value was definitely part of it. Um, just, you know, a, a lower cost sword doesn't have to be as good as a higher cost sword to provide good value. So that was my kind of thought process. And then I also would restricted myself from putting anybody into S tier if I only had one sword experience with one sword from them because I wanted to make sure, uh, to me, consistency is incredibly important to S tier. And I didn't feel comfortable putting anybody there if I did not have more experience with more than one sword. And I actually had somebody comment on that, my video recently that said, I should have had the same uh, criteria for F tier that I shouldn't put somebody in, in there with only one experience. and. That, that's a very valid point. I probably, I, I probably would agree with that. And I only put two in F tier, if I remember right. And the one I would move to D tier because of that criteria would have been Dark Sword Armory. But we can get into it more later. Oh, we will. That's one that we, I think, all had very different uh, experiences on. The when you're. Um, I think I took a little bit of the same approach, Kyle, and that I didn't, if I, if I had no experience and I had only seen pictures, uh, I didn't, I didn't evaluate it, but I, I do kind of like the approach of consistency as well. I think that that has merit. I, I did not do that. There are a few that I think I put in the S tier where I did not have copious amounts of experience, but, um, also it would be kind of tough. Like I, I wonder, you know, if I had the luxury of having, held a sword from every one of these makers. Like, I don't know, there's probably not too many people out there that have held like multiple from Peter Johnson or Patrick Barda or, you know, some of the, some of the guys out there. Kane, did you have any thoughts on how you approached it? Well, uh, it comes at several fronts. First of all, 
a value source as you know source they have to function as source you know they have to handle like one if this uh historical reproduction it has to handle in the exact specified you know period purpose and i'll carry all the correct traits and handle like one right like um, you, you, you can that's what i value the most right they function they must function as source they can have a lot of you know very high complexity in the hilt design you know um you know uh, etching or inlay or, or complex hilt but they have to handle like the original um otherwise i don't i don't care whether you have uh, you buy a steel flat from hope depot and glue on a bunch of De Beers, you know, diamonds, that doesn't change my my opinion towards such object. I mean, you can sell up such object, I have no objection, but that wouldn't uh, be categorized as a sword, right? And with that said, we are not really assessing each individual piece, each individual sword, right? We are, this is not a sword review, this is a general impression of a maker Right, uh, as either a business or as a person. So I take a lot of consideration of how this person, beyond just working on source, what kind of research research he does, presumably uh, pour into the work, right, the pieces, the, the, the source, uh, but also how they interact with the community because they can, some people like to hoard knowledge. So, I mean, that's their right. But if they are willing to share with the community and let the community grow, help the community grow, that 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 in my book, that's a bonus, right? And if they are very transparent with their process, uh, either creation, the creation of each of their individual pieces, or like their philosophy of making swords, that in my mind, that's definitely a bonus. And on the other hand, if you attack customers, gaslight like customers, and fight customers or ghost them, that's to me definitely a minus. Or if you deliberately spread misconceptions or, or just straight lies about you know sores or, or other makers for your personal gain, that's definitely a minus, right? Like it's very scummy behavior. Like as a maker, I, I just don't think I can condone that. And some 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 company. Business is very dynamic out there, right? Like you have stock model, in, like in just stock models you can order from. You don't need to specify anything, but you can also commission full customs from them, right? Based on museum pieces or, or the pieces they have in their possession or either from the artwork, right? Or on their own research or, you know, the customer's research. And if they are, able to oblige right that, that means that they are able to work with the customer to interpret their needs that's definitely a definitely a bonus and but also like businesses like arms or armor they regularly share their knowledge but as a member of the community not just like a customer even if you don't ever consume their their their, their products just as like consumption of information the data they put out there like you already get a lot for free. So I definitely take that into consideration. Um, so yeah, basically that's my criteria. And like in terms of whether I have handled them in person, right? Like if I have handled them in person, that's I examine them or I own them extensively, then I have very, you know, intimate, you know, in person knowledge about I I'll I could be one hundred percent sure. Otherwise, I'll I can't just you know listen to rumors. People say, "Oh, X X X X Y Z does good work." That doesn't mean anything to me, right? I because our own experience is always does, does it mean something if it's if there's been a lot of it? Like if unanimously uh, people are like, "Hey, the quantity, this the quality, the quality of the information you know been put forward, like well documented with data." Right, like clearly well measured data, like from you or Kyle or lots of other, you know, customers. That has to be customers, right? Like cannot be just hearsay or rumors. And you know, if it's documented in video form, that's the best, right? Or a photo or concrete measurements and characterization, right? Like how 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 do you 
describe the you know the, the edge sharpness or the handling the mass distribution but if you have concrete data that to me is very you know credible and if you have i have seen tell them and put forward now obviously i can take that into consideration because we all subconsciously we all do take that into consideration whether you maybe you have handled one piece from a maker but then the, the opinion surrounding this maker whether it's positive or negative uh, subconsciously already you know it, it clouds or not, not it, it has some impact on your judgment and we just simply cannot you know discount all that that well at least not to me so, so Kane and, and, and Kyle, you're you're going. Sorry, I'm cutting you off. No, it's okay. Um, I was just going to say Kane brought out something that I forgot to mention, and that is um, how a maker interacts with me as a person. Their customer service definitely impacted my ratings as well. Yeah, I, I, I can imagine if you have a, I mean, buying a sword is a, a luxury toy collectible thing for you know for a lot of folks. Sometimes it's a tool, but a lot of times it's. Uh, it's kind of a novelty luxury thing and the experience of buying it can certainly, you know, add or, or <laughs> dramatically subtract from, from that experience. But, uh, Kane, you, you, you mentioned that, you know, you're, you're not going on hearsay, uh, if there's data and information there, but in the ratings, I noticed you, you felt, you know, pretty keen to observe what people had put out there and then assign a tier on stuff that maybe you haven't handled. Uh, do, do you think that that leaves you um, that you're as comfortable putting things in a tier and rating them, even though you haven't had like kind of hands on experience? Do you think it would change? Do you think you're it's kind of fluffy? I, or, uh, yeah, yeah, definitely. If I have like hands on experience or I own some of their pieces, like a uh, like closer examination or they just personal in person, you know, handling um with with their with their pieces i can I'm definitely you know it's it's changing my opinion is definitely like some of the makers i held high opinion uh you know towards them but now i've seen more like not just my personal experience but other from other you know reviewers i definitely changed my opinion towards them um but i yeah I, I, I think I, I gave caveats in, in the rating before that. Like I, 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 I will know that I don't have any personal experience. So, you know, take that, take the, my letter grade rating, you know, however you will. Right? Sure. I, like, I don't think many of them are very controversial, but yeah, like I'm no. it's subject to, to change. Right. I, I've had a few experiences with, with sword makers that, I would say I, I kind of went in from photos and maybe other other people's online impressions or other videos that I've seen. I went in thinking, you know, I went in with a certain expectation, and there's there's been some that have been uh, surprising in both both ways. Frankly, you know, there there's been some the uh, the LKHN, for example. There's a arming sword that Cult of Athena sent me. I got to do a review on, but you know, I've, I've I've seen generally positive things from LK Chen. I think you gave them a very high praise, gave the same sort of very high praise, Kane. Uh, but it was really surprising. Right. Like I, I honestly wasn't expecting something as nice and nimble. And I, you know, I've, I've seen a, a fair amount of LK Chen swords, but even holding a new, you know, something outside of their general purview, I was, I, I kind of had this expectation of something maybe more clumsy than, than was presented. And instead, I got this really great sword and. By contrast, there was a Depika sword, and I, I thought it would be kind of meh, uh, but it was, you know, more of a turd Ferguson. It felt fell apart a little more prematurely. Anyway, I would say those hands-on experiences really, like if I didn't have them, uh, it, I would struggle. Like it seems like so many, each time I go through this, there's some some element of hands oniness that is required for me to really formulate an opinion. Um, yeah, that, about that LKHM piece, like I, I seem to have a, like a very, very different experience from yours. Like not, not just with the sword, right? With I'm assuming you're talking about the Templar sword. So yeah. judging from the photos and the data they provided, I anticipated this sword to be an amazing sword. Right? I have very high expectations, and I, I was shocked that they were able, even just from the photos and the, and the stats, they were able to provide it. 
because I know like these high medieval swords, they are very, you know, austere, very stern, you know, in, in looks. But I look at the detail of fin and finish, I, I, I anticipate them to be great. And, but when I, when I had a chance to handle it, I own, it, own one, it's um it's amazing it's it's even better than i thought but not very far from you know how i anticipated so yeah you you came in with with more grandiose expectations then i uh not that i i expect little from lk chen there you know he he knows what he's doing when he's making swords the designs are thought out and generally they're they're more meticulous than you might expect uh, given the price but i really didn't expect it you know i didn't I guess I didn't expect what, you know, spoiler alert, I guess, for the view. It's it's amazing. It's a fantastic sword. Now, Kyle, you, you recently talked about a Balor Arms piece, I think, or maybe it was Vic and John. Somebody talked about a Balor Arms, something that looked like the Brescia Spadona. Uh, that was the um, the Honshu one. That, uh, that the is Italian basically longsword. What, yeah, the right. Italian, 15th century Italian longsword that is basically the Balor Arms one, same maker as the original one. There's questions about who owns the design of it, but I'm not going to get into that here. Um, the Honshu Open the one, can, it's fine. <laughs> the Honshu one definitely surprised me in that it was a, a lot stiffer than I was expecting because of the, the way the distal taper was implemented. and um it's it's such an interesting sword because that specific design really speaks to me a lot it it i i've always enjoyed that design and the swords work well for me but at the same time that's sort of first sword you right like, is there a sword one of first sword one, it wasn't my first but it was one of my first my first was the um i think it was the arbedo the wind arbedo Right. Okay, it, maybe it was it was John and Vic, but I want to say somebody talked about the LK Chen version of that sword, and yeah. the the like uh, hilt doesn't seem as as put together as on the Templar sword. Like there's some differences, but it seems like they really nailed that Templar sword. It was the long way around it is I was trying to make the point that like I so often even with things that I should be familiar with, I've had you know a dozen swords from LK Chen in other you know, culturally influenced blades. They're Chinese stuff. Uh, so I thought I had an idea of what to expect, but they still managed to to impress. Um, and so I'd be really, you know, uncomfortable being like, yeah, that's that's a good or a bad. It's this or that tier, unless I put my hands on it. Happens that way with Katana all the time too. I know that's a little bit more my, my the shtick I'm known for. I like to think I'm open to any sharp pointy object, but, you know, I, I, the Katana seem, I, I seem to be known more for them and, I'll, I'll look at something and it kind of, I get an idea of like, oh, it looks like a part's been special. And then I get it and I'm like, oh, this, this is actually really nice. Like there's a lot of little things that can go right once you get it in the hand that you know what, um, <laughs> what, what Katana, that makes me think of is the Surudoi from Romance of Men, which really surprised me with how well put together that one was. And I think you reviewed one also, Matt, and mm -hmm. were generally pretty impressed by how much they've improved on it. Very much. You, I, I think they're a great example of um, a company that listens, doesn't, you know, talk down to their customers, takes feedback, even if it's delivered rather harshly, uh, you know, with, with maturity and poise and, and aims to improve and then actually acts on it. And so I, as I look at the, the, the swords that have been sent my way for review, there's, there's been a, you know, a reasonable step toward improvement each and every time kind of culminating with, with that sword which I think, you know, it, it's just funny. The first one that I got from them was, meh, no, this, this is, you know, generally to be avoided. And now they're like, ah, oh, that's a very compelling, you know, one, well, that's one of the better deals. And it, you know, for me, if I was looking for a sword for uh, 160 bucks, then it's also got like swirly mitzodomes all over it. Like it's well-built and it has that. I mean, I better only buy 10. There, There's also... The example of someone are willing to, you know, work with different contract makers and they, they also, they do some in-house designs, but they also take others designs like Hangshu, right? Hangshu is not, it's not really, it's a brand, but it's not really a maker or even like 
one set of designers. Like they started from in-house design of tactical more ninja stuff and just stamped out in somewhere in China. And it, it was poorly designed, you know, we, we have review of their, their stores, they have some common problems, but then those are definitely no go. But even under the same brand, they later just contracted Windless to make for them. And they say, okay, so build, build us a sword. Give us your, your, your feedback, right? And Windless is not someone who can, you can just let them do whatever they want and they're gonna come out with good <laughs> designs. And it's just, they have this one single-handed sword, which turned out to be like five and a half pounds, which is disastrous. But then they they take you know community feedback and they talk to them. Then you can't make this this heavy, right? And subsequent models like the Claymore, the Scottish two-handed sword, they they sent me is drastically improved, right? Still by Windless. And then they, they contracted um, you know the OTC, right? Which Kyle re reviewed. That design was done by Cosmosina, so it was people with experience. They look at all, a lot of the uh, Peter Johnson's design and take a lot of you know cues from like Sora's by Angus Strim, like distal taper, you know, mass distribution. But the good thing is that it, there was a, some inconsistency. Like the Kyle received the, the very first batch of the Italian long sword that was pretty pretty good, right? And and then I received one that's that's totally you know mango, like just. They got they got much much thinner, very floppy, and we made some suggestion that you, you gotta beef it up, right? Well, while maintaining that distal taper, you see, we gotta beef up the thickness, and they they, they terminated the contract with Calcina. Now they just take their designs, but obviously they, they did. Obviously they take the advice, which is valuable, and now the the output they have is much much, much better. So. And while Casasino finds someone else to, to improve such design, right? LK Chen, and resulting in something altogether different. It is just, there's a story there and you know, different paths. It's like the RPG where you have multiple dialogue choices. It, it ends in you know different places. Yeah, uh, very nuanced places. It's uh it I think I think it the the subtle differences between those models, I don't think we would think of as subtle, but you know the, the same model made by all these different manufacturers and kind of their attempt at that design, um, and the improvements that that happen over time with a given manufacturer. Like to us, I think they're leaps and bounds different. But to I think a a fair amount of people that probably own those swords, they'd be like, man, yeah, they're the same. <laughs> the the in the exactly. of swords nerds. With that specific design, you know, LK Chen also has done made changes to it. The first one, that was one of the first uh, Valor Arms swords they made was the Italian longsword. I got one of those. And it was incredible. The, the tip geometry was very different. The entire blade profile was a much narrower blade, and it was honestly too flexible. And I provided some feedback to both LK Chen, but more primarily, to Cult of Athena's designer. And they, on the further iterations, they have redesigned the profile to be much more broad overall. I mean, not much more, but broader overall. And it looks like they've stiffened up the blade some. So it's that's that model has seen so many revisions throughout its lifestyle and it's, or its life. And it's probably going to keep seeing them, which is good to see because, you know, the more feedback, you, the designer gets the better they can make the sword if they're willing to listen to the feedback. I uh, uh, no, I think you might. Sorry, you go ahead. Well, I was just saying that that one is interesting because it's iterative in a way that doesn't, you know, it's like it moves from like okay to worse to much worse to better to worse to better to worse to better like. And then it's like, no, this one's still getting like better, worse, better. And then this one over here is getting better and better. And anyway, it, it has a weird, it has a weird path, those designs. If, if you look at the ones out there, which I suppose makes buying one secondhand kind of dubious, where you're like, it looks like that. I think I know what it is, but is it one of the poopy ones or one of the good ones? That's 
tricky to tell. And, and Willis also made one, right? And which is yep. further complicated things. And their their stuff is also drastically different, which highlights the importance of having someone who actually knows this stuff to advise them, right? That, that the obvious models made by LK Chen for bottle arms, I think I talked to KK, they said they, they have, from LK Chen's side, they didn't have much input. So it's all, all given by Cosina to LK Chen. And LK Chen's usually workflow is that they find an expert, expert, right? He is an expert, but if he doesn't own a piece of antique, he'll find another expert to measure it at the museum, like Metropolitan Museum or like a private collection. And, and then they send the measurement and all the uh, photos and all the you know characterization to them. And they are going to create a prototype and this kind of process. Whereas Caldecina is just like, oh, we have this rough idea. You know, make me, give me Game of Thrones. <laughs> uh, that kind of thing. I, I, want, I want our uh, Albion connection. And so yeah, I, there's, yeah. I think it's it's so, probably fair to say that a lot of a lot of the vendors know how to make a sword, but I, I think they may well think of swords differently than than at least we do. Um, I, the sword market is is I think a lot bigger than I I probably understand, but I think they they think of them as products, right? And so as you see, like what's causing returns, what's breaking, make them thicker. Well, we still sell as many when they're when they're a little bigger, but we get a lot less you know complaints or returns. Um, you know, the, I, I imagine there's a lot of solving that is somewhat antithetical to, <laughs> to the uh, original intended use and dynamics of, of the sword, but nevertheless solve, solve problems for customers in a way that, you know, ends up just being like kind of a bar of steel product development. It's developed like a hammer rather than a, a sword. Uh, I, I suspect that's the case, but I don't, you know. I don't frequent the halls of windless, so I don't, I don't know exactly how that would work. But I could see somebody who's thinking about it like as a mass manufactured product um, doing that. But somebody was silly enough to give us a super chat here, so I'll, I'll pull that up. Um, for Kane, why do you think reproductions of migration eras, era swords tend to have decent looking helts, but ahistoric blades with fullers and sharp points more befitting the, of the Viking era. So I guess it's just the, I'm assuming that you're talking about the, um, the, the I wouldn't say mass production, the production company, sorry, not the, uh, from experts like uh, Owen Bush or Patrick Barta. They, they have, you know, all the knowledge about migration error source, but if you go to, like production companies like Hanway, they are able to make pretty decent migration error blades, but they are, they have some inconsistent like inaccuracies in the details, right? Like the the fuller doesn't terminate into into the hilt, and the the tip is is more pointed, and they just that then then they then the originals are they just like they they didn't do adequate homework. For their production models, and they have you know, sometimes, if you don't have the access, you just have to you know ask experts, right? Like you have to reach out. You can't be arrogant and say, ah, oh, you know, and people wouldn't, they wouldn't know this, you know. And like like uh, Matt just said, like a, a good sword is generally a good product. And we will hope so, but bad sword isn't necessarily a bad product. From a corporate point of view, if they save budget on research, right? In my, they might have good margin, and indeed, lots of people wouldn't notice, right? Like you, you the people in here uh, watching right now, they most of them would notice, but the, the general market, the general population, they don't necessarily. You know, I imagine they, anyone they, tuning they in our channel, Kane, is pretty pretty in the weeds on sword nerding, and would probably. <laughs> to, to answer, to give my answer to that question, I would guess that most of the production companies have seen my, the existing migration era swords and pictures, which are two dimensional. So they see what the hilt looks like and they see the basic profile of a blade, but they don't have a chance to study it. So they don't have, have any idea of what the intricacies are and what the nuances are. So they can duplicate 
the basic look of the hilt, which generally will look pretty good, although it won't have a lot of the more intricate details like the actual separate ring or the precious gemstone inlay and that kind of stuff. But then the blade, they'll, honestly, a lot of them will probably just reuse a Viking era sword and put it onto their uh, their migration era hilt. You didn't ask me, Sam, but since you basically gave me ten dollars, I'll I'll answer too. Um, I I honestly, in the background, I kind of suspect that just spatula tips and stuff, while they're historic, or don't sell well. Uh, I think you, you're when you're selling a Viking sword, there's like ergonomics that go in, but I think a lot of people are buying a look as well, and I, I'd venture I guess that they don't they don't sell well. Uh, there's I I don't know for certain, but like as I look at the the types of swords that are out there for Viking styles, there's some there's some single edge swords. I know the Albion uh, is it the Berserk or something. There's there's a single edge Albion one. I I don't know how popular it is, other than with people that want something you know, a little off the beaten path, but I think there's, there's probably a, a consumer mindset that, you know, the, the Viking sword is supposed to have that. And if you put this kind of rounded spatula tip on it, people are going to think it's broken before they buy it. Um, and it likely result, well, it has less mass appeal would, would be uh, something I would suspect. Be kind of neat if you could do a make your own Viking sword, you know, pick some hilts and blade styles and have somebody mush them together. There's all the pick your own katana kind of thing. You know, got to be neat if there was a parts bin out there with some Viking stuff in it. I'd still probably not like any of them. And I'd, I'd love how they look on my wall, but I'd swing them around and say, ouch. Uh, Unshe Sword Reviews is in the room, by the way. They were invited to come, but were too cool for us. I think somebody had a date and I encouraged them to join with their date to make it really impressive. That would be one of the best ways to wow your lady would be to get on a live stream with a bunch of sword nerds talking Absolutely. about the nuances of <laughs> dynamics and <in> European <laughs> God I can't even can't even say it out loud but uh, they said they can't come because of all the handsome on the screen I'm assuming they don't mean me um, old five head here doesn't get so much attention the uh, I appreciate that they have the link too that you can hop in guys John Vic but you got to do your homework you got to tell us what you think about all the all the s words because they didn't they didn't fill out the uh, they didn't do a video, but they're still invited because they're really cool. Anyway, uh, why don't we move on to some of the the things that we thought about things? And I don't know if we want to go alphabetical. <laughs> we can, but is there uh, is there anything pressing on either of your minds around uh, things that you found particularly interesting after we've all gone through it? Things that might be fun to prattle on about more. Yeah, since uh, since Chris is here in the chat, uh, Chris Fields, it is really hard to rate your uh, company when you have three different makers with three very different styles and three different makers marks. They still all get S tier for some reason because they're. He was saying <laughs> that two of them are you know under the umbrella of cotton cotton sore. No, um, so Chris Fields. It's the it's what I consider Sterling Armory, and then there's Colton Mog, who right. is Sterling Armory also, but his swords are marked as BT for Copper Copperthorn Customs, and then there's Josh Horbear, who I believe his, he has a new maker's mark that's just a bear paw, and they're all Sterling Armory, but it's they're three incredibly unique. That's makers. really confusing, man. I would just consider them serving armory, though. <laughs> yeah, uh, the, I, I imagine that's that's a little uh, that's a little different. I, I don't know how the production stuff works out. I'm I'm sure Chris can regale us with probably the exact answer to that. But I don't know. Like uh, different manufacturers have different lines of of swords, and if it's easier to be sold from one side or under one moniker, then. I can see how it's uh, confusing, but at the same time, like I, it's not a, all that much different than the different lines you might find from casts or something like that, um, or or even Cold Steel. They have 
and not that I'm comparing them to Cold Steel, but you have the Battle Cry <laughs> this, and you have the you know other that like a long shot of armory, right? Yeah. Long that's probably that's, a better uh, example. That is a good example. John Long demo, but also had Casey Long and um, Jeffrey Robinson. So basically. So. But uh, Chris, I think uh, so. Sterling Armory is one that I think we all probably rated quite high. Let me let me see. Sterling Armory got a unanimous S tier from all three of us. And if I look online, that's what I'm I'm trying to do with this little uh, sheet right here. This is the the live poll, which incidentally there are 34 people in the room, and nobody else went on since the start of this live stream to vote anymore. So, <laughs> shame. You can hopefully you have multiple screens. Many are probably watching while you. Oh, vote, though, that that right. tier so. that tier maker website bug. Like if you don't refresh it, it will never show new people voting, even though there are new results. Oh, now I refreshed it and I got 404 not found. Oh, no, crap. Um, like, oh, here we go. Yeah. No, now it's refreshed and it still says 17. I appreciate that. I probably shouldn't have refreshed because then I could just hope. But um, Sterling Armory, it's not just us, Chris. There, you're, you're getting more than just us as an S tier. And uh, and the others seem to be falling in the A tier. So, you know, you're, you you got to give yourself a little bit more more credit right here. I don't know if that's uh, that's you being surprised, Chris, or if that's uh, you making a statement of like, yes, Sterling Armory S tier, of course. But I, sus I suspect it might be surprised. Um, and yeah, I. I think he's saying that tier S is stands for Sterling Armory. Yeah, like C for Cold Steel, D for Tipika. <laughs> I don't think that's how it works, but <laughs> that is probably right, Kane and Kyle. I. I I don't read so good. <laughs> Probably because I, I spend too much time around all, all the, the lead swords and whatnot. It's but yeah, me, uh, speaking me the dirt. Of somebody who probably has more experience with Sterling Armory swords than most other people, I might actually have more swords from Chris than other people, than anybody else, I don't know. But he, they deserve all the attention they can possibly get. Even, if you haven't had a chance to try out a Sterling Armory sword, you really, really should. Just check out the Combat Call and so called Sword Fights, uh, you know, competition cutting finals. You, need, you get all the information you need there. <laughs> and Kyle's reviews, obviously. And, and my past review. Yeah. I, it, it's been a minute since I got to play with one, but um, I, I mean, out of the gate, I thought the the fit and finish. I know Chris is humble about it, but I thought they were uh, pretty well nipped and tucked for handmade objects, especially in the European sword realm. Generally, pretty even lines. Stuff didn't waver around all that much. And if you have any appreciation for kind of handmadiness, then what little imperfections there were didn't really deviate from what seemed like the intent, and kind of gave it a sense of of humanity a little bit. Um, but every one that I picked up felt fantastic. You know, when you when you pick up a sword and it feels like whoever made it thought that like it should feel that way, and you can almost sense the intent and the capability and skill to deliver that intent in your hand is kind of a special thing. And each one had a you know a different personality, but I could it it felt like hey somebody thought about how this should feel, and and was able to make it. It doesn't feel like it happened on accident. But then other little things apart from, you know, you can pick it up and it moves nice, but uh, the the grip really locked in my hand right away. Um, all the parts looked really crisp, but didn't, you know, didn't make me bleed. They weren't like sharp or something like that. Some of the Valiant Armory pieces I've noticed, they have a really crisp look, but the edges tend to be a little bit sharp on them. And so they don't always feel comfortable when you move them around. Uh and then you know stainless steel bits on the on the on the hilt and whatnot. Like I don't, <laughs> it looks pretty, and it might stay that way a little bit longer. Just a lot of little details from somebody who you can tell likes swords and has also bought them and been frustrated by other things. Uh, but yeah, they they seem to be, you know, just little little tweaks uh, from that engineer brain of Chris came through, and I 
I really like I really enjoyed them. I didn't know necessarily what to expect before I got some to review. Uh, you know, I, I know Chris is a smart guy. I met him before I got a chance to play with his swords. But, you know, lots of smart people do dumb things. <laughs> so just because you're a smart guy doesn't mean you can make a good sword. But um, Chris, Chris has it where it counts. All the ladies out there, if he's single, put your number in chat, Chris. <laughs> he can build you a space shuttle and make you a sword. What more do you want? Yeah, and uh, I want to add this, that uh, Angus Trim examined their pieces and gave very high praises, right? Like he compared their their source to some of the pieces by, you know, a couple sort gods that Angus Trim regards. So that's, hey, it's not it, all the right boxes, right? Like I check all the right boxes, the handling, dynamics, but also fit and finish. So there you go. So Gus Sterling himself. Armory. Somebody else went on there. It was probably Chris to put himself in S tier, but it refreshed, okay, and it went to 18. Yeah. Something, something happened. Good. Great. All right. Yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll switch gears to uh, another one that I, I wanted to talk about. There were a couple in here that we, we were unanimous on. Sterling Armory happened to be one of them, but uh, Dark Sword Armory, can of worms. Let's jump right into that one. Uh, because we had very, we all had pretty different ratings on it. So I think I put a a B. Kane, you were a C, C, and Kyle, you were an F. So I am curious. We all have very different experiences, Kyle. Like I, I look at some of the the things that I've, the experiences I've had with with those swords, and the earliest ones were, I would say, they got better from the the earliest ones that I've seen. Uh, how do you account for the disparity? Where, where, what did you have that was? How did it hurt you? <laughs> that the sword I reviewed from Dark Sword Armory was one of probably the worst sword I've ever used handled. It was a terrible design that could not be used with proper uh, European sword techniques because of the cross guard design. It was wildly too flexible blunt to the point of not being sharp in, in the slightest and just a miserable experience using the sword. Um, how do I account for the fact that they've changed that so much? It's because from every bit of, of knowledge I've been able to gather, from every bit of uh, investigation people have done, they do not make their own swords. They contract uh, makers probably from India to make their blades, probably make their all their hilt components and their possibly their grips, ship them all into Canada. And my hunch is they assemble them in Canada. And because they seem to change source forges every so often, I have no idea what the their the life cycle of a contract with the forge is, but they don't seem to enforce consistent specs at all from the different forges. So you never know what you're going to get. I've The sword I reviewed, the it was the, the Gothic two-handed longsword, if I remember the name right. And its specs are around three pounds, if I remember right. Mine weighed about two pounds, 12 ounces. And I've seen other people who reported theirs weighed four pounds. I mean, a pound and a half difference there is just outrageous. And that's what happens when you have one blade that has no distal taper and another blade that has uh, a lot of distal taper and then another blade that starts too thin and doesn't taper or another blade that starts thick and tapers. The, the fact that there's no consistency, that seemingly no consistency there leads to it being a complete crapshoot what you're going to get from them. That sort of I, I that, sold to Kyle by the way for for yes. review. Purposes. Thanks, King. No, otherwise, I, I, <laughs> otherwise he he lost a bit of money on that one too because after he's reviewed, no nobody is gonna buy that one. You know, 
and and he somebody, he bought he somebody bought it he yep. bought it for, for your knowledge you know but uh, I have more to say about that piece is that I own the first yeah. and I already did review yeah I, I and, just want to clarify somebody mm -hmm. did actually buy that I did sell it they bought it because their kids wanted to see as he they called it the famous snake sword because of how much it bends when cutting. Yeah. But yes, I took you a bath on if, that. You if you haven't watched his review and he's cutting with that sword, just watch it. it it's worse every single second. Uh, uh, just the, It's amazing. He, he cut a, like a very small water bottle and the blade basically flexes in, in like 15 different places. And it flexes for about a minute and a half before it stops. <laughs> Yeah, Maybe a little it, bit of it, it hurt his wrist, literally. Like if you watch his face afterwards, like he was literally in pain. That sword is probably yeah, it's very iconic for it. And it's not like like a crap shoe, it's it's a one one off deal. If you look at one of the uh the videos published by Io, uh you know, the, the owner is how you pronounce his name. I, I think it's CIL. I could be wrong. Yeah, but... L. So he was doing he was doing a pretty popular video regarding to the durability of Dark Sword Armory Source. So the way he did it is that he stepped onto the blade and flexed the blade. He basically bent it into not just a, like he bent it to a seat. Like I, I could do that. I just bend the blade to, to curl in such a way that it's parallel, basically parallel. And mm -hmm. that such flexibility resulted in just like complete dysfunctional blades, right? At that level, both the design of the blade, it, it's it's very light, right? Like when I I didn't cut with it, but I used it to, you know, do some form training. I used it to do some motion capture and it, it handles pretty well because it's lightweight. It has a lot of diesel taper, right? It handles pretty well, but it, and it's pretty safe because it's dull. Like you accidentally nick yourself, it's never gonna cut anything, right? And the thing is that a few years later, they sent the sword of that model to Matt Eason, and it's already like a pound heavier. So basically, that's better, right? It's, it's stiffer, but he couldn't cut with it because it's given how dull it was. Still very dull. Because they, they import all the dull blades. And if the edge geometry happens to be, you know, hollow brown, they don't know how to sharpen it. They just grind it a little bit and there's no sharp edges on it. And then I know people got gotten new batches, you know, one from their new batches of that exact sort that weighs four and a half pounds. So you gotta wonder what the hell is going on here from two and a half pounds to three and a half pounds and then to four and a half pounds. And a couple of years later, it's returning to, you know, it's now a more reasonable. So I think they, you know, switch back to a, to a new forge. That's, that's reasonable with it. And, but the profile is, is a little bit different than before. So basically you, you can't really expect any level of consistency. And also I showed that, uh, Matt reviewed the, um, the, um, the Alexandria, right? That sort when you receive it, you, you mentioned it was pretty reasonable, the weight, about, you know, less than three and a half pounds, right? So for that size, for the very broad profile, it, it's pretty reasonable, like 3.4 pounds. And then Matt Eason got one from them, and it weighs four and a half pounds. And, and he never did any review on that one because he, how can you review that? Like, And I know somebody else did a review of that sword and they got the same batch like weighs four and a half pounds that so i talk about him gentleman's choice so like a major uh advocates for <laughs> dsa swords he, he couldn't he couldn't excuse it like he was he couldn't compute his brain couldn't compute why this happened and then he he, he did that review that was his last review and then he deleted his entire entire channel because because of that sort. I, I recall that game to 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 validate. He he also had one, I believe, that was um uh, over four pounds. And the yeah. example I just looked at the records I have was three pounds seven ounces. So a little less than yeah, three and a half so pounds. Under. So to go up to 
to a, um, I, 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 what am I trying to say here? Um, that's a nine pound difference or a nine ounce difference. Nine ounces, I think. No, Not that's ten. eleven. I think it's more eleven ounce. Eleven ounces difference. He, he there's he sixteen went from, ounces in a yeah. pound. Yes, people are receiving okay. four pounds, four pounds and four ounce yeah. difference. Four pounds and four ounce at a maximum. So basically, yeah. that's their consistent. Why? Because they lost access to the forge that made your sword, your Alexandria sword, and they had to find someone else. And that 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 someone else couldn't do the same, you know, same job as the previous one. And, I, but I think that since then, yeah, they, they switched to another one who did a better job. With them. So you see, they just it, it that that yeah. gets into speculation a, a bit. I, I I find the community is pretty quick to say Dark Sword Armory does this. That's how their supply chain works. Uh, they definitely make them. They import them. I don't know. I, I'll I'll just put I found a, their import uh, record. Me too. But they also, so do, I mean, the the day job that I have involves a fair amount of importing and dealing with third parties. And if you're yeah. if you're importing, which Dark Sword Armory says they uh, they do, they sell some pieces from India and in their armor. They sell uh, Chinese made swords, and they disclose that. And so what what I don't see that's conclusive based on those import records is like, um, you know, the the specifics or photos or like anything that doesn't also line up with with what they've disclosed uh and they've seemed pretty adamant that they're made in canada i don't i don't know though right like that that's the thing is uh, I, do, I do see like things from otc that also look very similar but then when i've gotten those yeah. swords in hand uh or I, I don't remember if it was otc but somebody it looked really similar but they didn't um in in person they looked a little bit you know a little bit different the material looked a little different than it did in the photos and so i i don't uh just to put a contrary thing out there, because I know that some people are very, very firm on <laughs> on it being one thing. I'll I'll say that I'm I don't know I, I don't know, but I also don't think apart from in the event that Dark Sword Armory is fibbing about where they manufacture their goods, I, I would like the company that I work with to be honest. But I don't know that it would make a difference to me personally if it was made in Canada or if they said I import them and make them in India. I would judge the sword the same way. I just like them to be honest about it. Um, but that's really yeah, all. I don't, I don't care where. They, yeah, I don't care where. Like, there's no problem at all. Like, yeah. buy it from whoever you want, right? Like, you want to make it in house or from anywhere else. Like, if it's a good product, it's a good product. I don't care where where it's from. Right? You buy like components from someone. You buy the whole sword from anyone. No problem, right? Who cares? Like they, they are just very adamant about these little things and they want to prove that they are entirely made in Canada and where it just it doesn't compute like uh, the, the thing is not where they're from right the thing is that they're so inconsistent and it's not like like a random like a very random thing it's I'm gonna during this interrupt the time, mm -hmm. to uh, to add uh to not because we have a new person to join oh, somebody hey. Hey. I opted to finally be in the cool kids club. Finally. I decided it was okay to join solo. I didn't need my 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 partner to jump in did with you, you guys for a few. Did you bring a date? I don't I recall that there was if you recall bourbon as a date, then yes, yes, I did. <laughs> That's the lonely man's date. That is the lonely, yeah. I don't know if you can tell, but yeah, a little lonely. It's fine. One is the loneliest number unless you have bourbon, I think is how that song goes. Uh, greetings, guys. Thank you for letting me uh, jump on for a little bit. I wasn't going to, but then you guys started talking about DSA, and I was like, oh, I have some thoughts. So, yeah. Well, uh, regale us with your thoughts. I'll let Kane finish. He was in the middle of making a really good point, and then uh, I'll Sorry. tag in if that works. Yeah, it's just that um, it's very it's very consistent that they are inconsistent. And it's not that... During one period, people will receive all random things. Everybody during that like 18 months will receive product with the same problem, right? Like either they are all very flexible but underweight, or they're all overweight. I mean, very like 
if you have a, like a number of in-house makers, right? Like they're pounding it out, they're grinding it in a certain way. That just is not from the same group of people, and it's and it's all very consistent. Like the 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 sword, Alexandria sword, uh, gentleman's choice received is almost exactly the same as the one Matt Easton received. And guess what? They are re received like two months apart from each other, and basically everything else, like the profile, you know, the way it, it, they handles. It's all just the same, right? And it, does, it doesn't mean that it's inherently a bad sword. It's just not the sword that they, they they send it to you and they mark it prior, right? And that's a big problem because like there's a certain amount of tolerance. Like even I, I returned an Albion sword. I, I reach out on a forum and saying, oh, this Albion sword is two ounces than, than the specification. It's like it should be a little bit under 1800 grams, like the Principe, right? And I said it's 1850 grams. I don't know whether, I'm not even sure whether it's, uh, you know, acceptable. It's finished very, very well otherwise. And Peter Johnson reached out to me and said, you know, show me some evidence. I show him some red evidence. That's not acceptable. I'll talk to Mexican man. Return the sword, they'll make a new one for me. And they did, right? Like, I don't expect. Dark Soul Armory or Hanway or Witless to stick to the same standard, but you, you can't say like, okay, today, okay, not today, this year is two and a half pounds, and next year is going to be four and a half pounds, and it's just, it's, it's like a lottery, right? They test your fortune. So go yeah. ahead, Vic. Actually, before Vic gives his, I just want to add one little thing. I don't care if they're made in India or if in Canada. It's the consistency that is a huge problem. And if they're made in Canada, why are they so wildly inconsistent? I, that doesn't make sense to me. Go ahead, Vic. So uh, I agree, Kyle, with your point and Matt, what you said earlier. It's like, I don't care where they're made as long as I know what I'm buying is going to be what they're advertising on their website. I think to me, one of the most telling uh, things about DSA was when I was first getting into the hobby, they were a very appealing maker because they were a price range that I could afford and they had some really, really cool looking swords. They still have like two or three models I would be interested in, but I don't trust them with my money anymore. Kane, actually the first video that I ever saw of yours was you talking about the two swords you got, the Henry V and I believe the uh, the Gothic long sword that you sent to Kyle. And when I received my five low Viking sword, I've talked about it in that review, it was covered in rust, had epoxy oozing out of every possible orifice. And I was just like, oh, is this okay? Like, am I supposed to be okay with this? Like, is cleaning it up immediately like a thing that I'm supposed to have to do? And like, I watched your video and I was like, well, apparently that's very unacceptable. Good, because that's how it felt. And so at least the issues on that one were cosmetic, but the Black Dead Gothic sword that I got, and I didn't know to look at this at the time because I was still learning about the hobby. Uh, I'm not entirely certain that that peen is actually a peen. I showed pictures of this to Kyle when we were chatting one time. And you showed Kyle pictures of your peen? Of my pain, yeah. So, so you don't even want to know what. Pictures. Was, oh, did you like? Did you like the pictures? I mean, it sounds I like they're close up and everything. You, you don't even you know. Unsolicited that. peen pics. <laughs> unsolicited peen pics are. Uh... I was like, hey, how does this look? He's like, bad. I was like, oh, and uh, no, but it was, it was terrible. Like it wasn't flush. It looked like it had the the edge of it had like popped off. It looked like it was filled with epoxy. Like it, if if that, it by no means looked like a stable sword at all. And talking about like switching forges and them probably varying in specs, when I bought my sword, it was listed at three pounds, six ounces, weight three pounds, seven ounces. That's great. The same model is listed at over four pounds now, which just to me says, oh, cool, no distal taper. And it already kind of handled like an overweight monster. So I just don't trust them. And with their prices going up, like if I'm going to give you $800, which is a lot of money to a lot of people, I don't have the faith that I'm not going to get a bad product. And, you know, so Matt Easton made a video not that long ago talking about possible review bias and possibly getting good samples sent to you. I'm nowhere near a big enough channel to get those kind of samples. But Matt, you've gotten lots of samples from DSA. And I wonder if that's ever crossed your mind. Like, are you getting yeah. like, good examples? Because there's a lot of people in the community that have gotten very, very bad luck with them. And to end my point, I'll say all of that would kind of be a pass if their customer service was fantastic. And it's really not like sure they basically have told me and other people go up yourselves. So that's where they really lose me as a company. Yeah, I I, I think I come off as a DSA defender, but that's that's only because there's accusations of lying about supply chain processes that in my day job I could say like, well, 
I mean, I'm not excusing them as like, hey, it's okay to make stuff that varies by two pounds. Like it could be right. plus or minus an extra sword um, or that it's going to be whippy and potentially hurt you when it's sold as a stout thing. Like those are those are not <laughs> things that I'm trying to trying to excuse. But I, I would uh, caution folks on saying, hey, this is definitely made in another country when it, it's there's suspicion and i think rightly so there are there are some things that do not necessarily uh make a ton of sense at the same time working with foreign supply chains myself there are things that don't make a lot of sense if you don't kind of know the method behind the madness mm -hmm. um and so i like a lot of people are really really quick to jump on you know correlation and causation or uh pointing to things as irrefutable proof that they're you know moving forges or or at least it's you know a couple examples online are are enough to uh give people the impression very strongly or prove it and i, I i'm i'm cautious there because i don't i don't know it would not surprise me if they are made in canada but it would also not surprise me if they are not um i don't i don't know like it wouldn't and it matters but it, it matters to the extent that they're at least they are at least like touch in some way in Canada, right? Like at least a hill assembly, the polish, right? They're, the they are shipped to me from Canada, you know. But yeah, yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. but I they are know, I, they're touch there. It's not, it's not like they're they buy whole you know, It's 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 one of those weird problems to me because it doesn't matter, you know. It, it's yeah. it's like that you you don't windless Royal Armory stuff is made in India. People mm -hmm. don't object yeah. to paying eight hundred dollars for it. It's not just because it's made somewhere else doesn't mean you can't charge a premium. Like I don't, yeah. I genuinely don't think people care, and I don't know how many people uh, made in Canada is a selling feature to or not. I mean, it's a nuance, but like I don't, I don't think people go to. I'm, I've always said it wrong, I guess. Tight ski. I don't think people go to that company and buy it because it's made in Thailand instead of China. Like I, I, if you make a good thing, then you make a good thing, and I think that's generally how sword buyers work so to so emphatically say it's made in canada to the point that you would lose customers on principle when it when they wouldn't care <laughs> is 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 baffling yeah. to me and, and part something that doesn't doesn't make a lot of sense but I, I i'm only throwing that out there not to not to change hearts and minds but just to put a different perspective there like i don't i don't have enough proof to say conclusively that they they do or don't um but but uh, inconsistency is your That right? is is definitely the case. Yeah. Now, uh, uh, you've mentioned, do I think that they send me biased samples? I it's crossed my mind anytime I get a sample, like it's a thing. I get the thing that I get, right? And I don't have. Uh, there's not somebody in like the other side of the country with a different name that's buying the same sword for me to for me to compare and contrast with any review that I do. I would say that like maybe the Alexandria and the Baron that I got and the War the Warwick Warwick no Al Albrecht Albrecht uh, that I got point. yeah those are usually yeah, like prototypes good. is is typically how they're disclosed to me is like hey we have this one it's a prototype one we've swung it around a little bit so you know it gives gives some it could get more or less attention being a prototype and could differ slightly from from what sold uh, but the messers that were sent to me, I think, are kind of kind of suggest to me that they're not <laughs> they're not really going over them with a fine tooth comb. <laughs> because there, there's a lot of things I think in either case that I that I pick apart. Um, but what what I find very surprising about Dark Sword Armory in particular is isn't just that there's variation because lots of people have variation, but the size of variation being fluctuating like a pound is pretty rough um, and. When I spoke to Yal at on um, we did a, a conversation online, he seemed to think like kind of be surprised that that was the case and that people were, you know, really frustrated to the level that they were, and seemed to think his customer service was like, just call us and we'll we'll make it right. But enough people have said like I called and they did not make it right. That's the thing. Wouldn't that be more concerning? Like if that's the case, then like I'm just speculating, perhaps there's a disconnect between what he thinks is going on and what's being handled what he would prefer and what's actually happening. Because I know just like us alone as our small little channel, we've gotten lots of emails and comments from people showing us pictures of like their really bad uh, products that they've gotten and then like a really bad response from customer service also. 
So, yeah. Yeah. And that, that does suggest to me that like something isn't in alignment and there's, there's room for improvement, but underneath that, I would, I would note that like my hope is for them to improve. And a lot of the, the comments that I get uh, around Dark Star Armory seem to be like, go die, go <laughs> fail. And I hope you all get cancer. Like that seems to be yeah. the YouTube comments. And it's like, I, I, I think they make neat looking stuff. I'd like it to feel good and be well-made as well. And I hope they, do whatever steps are necessary to make good stuff so that mm -hmm. there are more options on the market for people that want good swords. Um, I think they have some really stunning designs. Mm -hmm. They have some of them, some of their designs, some of them are not yeah. good, but um, <laughs> they're, they're, they're some of their like long swords that have a little bit of a fantasy take to it. They have a good eye for aesthetics, but translating that to a good sword is a whole other kettle of fish the, i just wanted to be cool my cane and hold a sword so <laughs> well, my take I'm, is I'm uh, old. um reviewers don't get specifically chosen examples good samples for them like mm -hmm. they're just it just so happens i like, when when man received the alexandra it just so happens that that's a good match right like, they didn't handpick it when Matt Eason received a, a Gothic longsword, that was a good match, right? He so happens to receive that. But here's the thing, right? Both you, right? Both uh, Jensen and Eason received bad, bad examples, right? Like the, uh, the, the not knock him back or whatever, the knee yeah. breaker or whatever. I think of yeah, it as cock knocker. The, Whenever I think of the sword, I think of it as yeah. cock knocker. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, and the messer, that's bad, right? And, um, Madison received a Alexandra, which is which is bad, and it just it suggests to me, and everything I've seen is that Isle is a very he's a he's a true enthusiast. He loves swords, he loves history. You see his pictures; he posts it around the world at the museum. But at his heart, he doesn't really understand what makes good swords. He just likes looking at them. He doesn't know he's not a practitioner, which is fine, right? Which is fine. But he doesn't really know how they should function, how they should, you know, you know each like the nago on the Greek semester, where it should be. It should be here, right? Like the, the like covering your your main hand outside line, and he put it down there, right? Because he think it's cool the design there, so you can't really hold it up, choke up to the cross cross guard because in German longsword, uh, German you know master fencing, you have to do this. Right, the sun, the sun grip. So you have to choke it up here. You gotta understand that in order to design your sword well. And he put it down there. So you have to hold the sword like this. And that sword has a very, very far uh, point of balance already because it doesn't have any distal taper. Right, and that's another design, like serious de design flaw. And compound that with the 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 wrong place for the. Uh, the Nago, and it just it's a very very dysfunctional sword and you look at other like the uh the, the new messer which is very interesting right a very broad profile it looks cool like if you are designing let's say i o should i o should be a designer for like a video game right all of his swords you put it as a 3d model like in elden ring or whatever they look cool right because the character doesn't hold it like your hand can clip through that noggle in the wrong place. You got your can can the noggle can go through your, your your palm, right? So there's no problem at all. Whereas you, when you make functional swords, right, like to be handled, to be used, to you know, it, you know like a technique prescribed by the treatises, and we do know how they are used. Like you have to you have to understand it first. Now if he has you know some humility and you listen to the community he talks to you you know you don't you don't need to talk to any random customer right you, you just say okay there's some problem i gotta find an expert let's find a you know german master fencing guy and we ask him right what what quality and traits you, you had to incorporate in a functional crease mess or a long mess when you have that and they, they tell you like instantly like instantly it's worth every penny you pay for this consultant, right? Immediately, you're gonna design products 
10 times, 100 times better. He, he, at his core, is that he doesn't really understand the functional sword, like that Gothic long sword. It has a protrusion on the cross guard, and you all remember that, right? Mm -hmm. When you have that, you, you can do the thumb grip. And that's just a big no no. Like, if you, you know anything about German long sword, you do any technique, you have to put your thumb on. I don't know whether you still have that. You don't, you sold that sword. So, there, there's there other folks that we we hold in high regard, though, Kane. That that also have some that don't get the same flack for different things. Like yeah, Angus uh, Trim, uh, Angus Trim uh, will will only put wheel pommels on, and they're sharp. And he says, "Don't hold them." Uh, like, yes, sir. <laughs> but if that were the only problem Dark Sword had, I think we'd probably let that it is, go. It's that is true. Well, uh, it, 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 it is you know things in totality. I, I, I one of the Cerberus Arms chimed in here. He's he's reviewed the the Ranger sword and he was his was also on the heavier side and he he made some comments to suggest his dissatisfaction with it. One thing that I'll point out though, so I I do think a lot of the flack that DSA gets online is very much warranted. However, we're all very active on like the sword Facebook groups or at least a few of them. One thing that I don't like is a trend that I've noticed. Whenever somebody does have a DSA sword that they actually genuinely like and it works for them and maybe they got a good example, they post a picture of it and then a dozen people just shit all over it, right? Um, and, like, that's not cool to me either. It's like, dude, if somebody has a thing and, like, they're happy with it, who cares if it's not historical? Who cares if it's overweight? Like, if they're happy with it, let them be happy with it. You don't have to just be like, because I hate DSA, I don't. But if I did, I don't need to go rage comment on any time I see a picture of one because somebody's happy they have one. So like, I guess that's just an internet thing, but that bugs me sometimes. I don't know if it bugs you guys, but yeah. There, There is an internet thing. We, we, uh, there, there does seem to be a few folks that are, are keen on pooping on the joy of others. I, I, I do think that it's fair to say like, hey, um, you know, there, there are some, if you get a sword and it's it's a uh, it's a giant turd, and that company, then you reached out to that company and they were like, "Hey, uh, go fuck yourself, uh, go fuck yourself real hard. Use the sword. We don't care." Then you would probably be real inclined to share that experience. I, yeah, you know, like I I will I will share my my frustrated experience with FedEx anytime anyone wants to listen, uh, you know, or. Or enterprise rental car, like just some people that have done me dirty. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> so if somebody's like, I had a great experience, to be like, well, let me tell you about mine. Um, so I, I, there's a way I think to do that tactfully, though, that doesn't necessarily rob somebody of their joy while simultaneously, uh, you know, giving a, a little bit of context for any prospective buyers that might be influenced by it. Agreed. Yeah, I think that you should just leave people be, and I, I believe that. DSA is capable of uploading good work. And it's, and it, it's not because they understand what good work it is. It's just so happened that they got a good batch and they, they put it on a hill, you know, mountain on a hill and goes to a customer. And they, they it's genuinely, I, I've seen examples like it's demonstrably functional, right? Like it's, it's, it's good, right? In multiple ways. It's, I, I don't, it's, I don't uh, that at all. Mm -hmm. Dark Sword Armory and Albion share some potential similarities. I, you know, I visited Albion and gotten a chance to walk around where where they're made, so I have some, you know, a, a passing familiarity with with the process and and seen the shop floor in person. Which incidentally, it's there's less people there than you might expect, but it's bigger than you might expect too. Um, but I haven't done the same with Dark Sword Armory, and I just imagine that if you're in a town. Sword nerds are few and far between. There's seldom to have more than a couple in, in a small space. So if Dark Sword Armory is having other people like grind on their swords, they make a design, they make them in batches. Hypothetically, can I know we we disagree on where where they potentially could be made? But still, Albion has the same thing. I don't imagine everyone there is a is a sword nerd. You know, they're they're people that grind on swords. I I don't know their activity and how much they collect or how interested they are, but they seem to very consistently put out, you know, things that are, are pretty true to the pattern. Not always. And when they don't, it seems like they generally speaking, make it right. I don't, I hear a lot of complaints about the wait time with Albion, but I don't hear a lot of other complaints about, about their inability to, you know, do this, that, or the other, or satisfy customers expectations. So I, I wonder why Dark Sword can't, like if there's a template, then why can't it be followed? 
I, I, would, I would say a, regardless of where they're made, though. I think that comes down to a company culture thing. I think Albion's culture is to be uh, demanding of, of meeting the specifications within X percent. And Dark Sword Armory, it does not have that culture. That's my impression. Is there is there any sword that you would really like from them if it felt good? Albrecht. The, Albrecht. the High King sword. It's been a great while. Sword. What's it's been that? a long time since I've looked at their website at this point, so I'd have to look. I really hope that the Cockknocker gets a revision. <laughs> um, <laughs> I hope they call it the cock knocker too and just just lean into it. And somehow but get like Mark Hamill to do the commercial. Oh yeah. Cock knocker. That, that would be yeah, I dig it. Um it's a, like a really fun looking sword. I wish it I wish it felt as fun as it looks and also didn't stab me, or stab me at least marginally less. Uh but I I really like I really like the design of that sword. I think it's flamboyant and fun, but yeah. Anyway, um we can move on because this was because <laughs> I think we we will uh, we will we will not reach we'll a consensus, but we can talk right. about another divisive one, uh, which was Ronin Katana. Uh, that was another one where we also had not as far apart, but we had uh, different ratings with each one. Vic, you had you've had uh, uh, Ronin Katana pieces, right? I have. And also, again, thank you for letting me hop on without knowing the homework because, yeah, we did not put out a, a tier list video. Um, but my only experience with Rona Quintana was with one sword, and that was with the double fullered longsword, um, one that I believe you reviewed, Matt, way back in the day. And yeah, again, one of my very first swords. I liked it a lot. I ended up selling it, though. Um, it was a little too big and heavy for me, um, not unlike the DSA sword. Um, but just reputation wise, I hear lots of good things about them, as you guys will probably discuss. So. Yeah, the uh, so Kyle, you I think gave it the uh the worst rating. And I gave it the I was a B, Kyle was a D, and Kane, you were a C. Um I give it a D based on the fact that their grips are except for their single-edged long sword, their grips are that I've experienced are just atrocious. I I hate the leather that they use, I hate the design of the grips. They're ugly. And it's they're too bulky and bulbous. The leather is soft and squishy, and I just have a. It doesn't, you know. I, I've said this before. The the grip is how you interface with the sword, hopefully, and that <laughs> if that's I'm not sure. good, that that you're going to have a bad time with it because you need that to be comfortable in your hands and. I do not find that to be the case with the Ronin Katana swords. Again, excepting the single-edged long sword, the, the two-handed saber. Well, I don't, I don't know exactly what to call it. Um, another than that, I also just find them in general clunky, a little bit overbuilt, a little overweight, not quite um, refined enough to feel good in the hand, in my to my taste. And I, I my first experience was also with that double fullered long sword. And that thing, the grip is a little bit better than the other one I had. But man, that thing is just, it is chunky. And yeah. it is, it's just not, it doesn't have the, the nimbleness that I feel like a sword should have. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, when I had it, I was so, really young and sword collecting, so I didn't really know any better. But sorry, Ken, go ahead. Yeah, I think that Roman Katana's your line is uh, tragedy and it's somewhat in like complete contrary to dsa right like dsa is just it's completely like the quality is random and it's dependent on the batch they order right like they, they have no control over it and they don't really know what's making good swords or bad swords they just put it on a hill and sh ship it off to the customer where rolling katana is that their prototypes are pretty good but there are problems, and they never really revisit those problems, those issues, or address them. You should have get gotten very solid feedback, like the wasted 
grips geometry. That is the singular worst grip design I have ever seen because you have the waist section, like the hip of the grip is wider, right? But it should be wider. It shouldn't be thicker. And it's on rolling katanas, uh, the grip is both wider and much thicker. It's almost like cylindrical. So at that section, the, the circumference is, is huge, massive. And it doesn't just look ugly. And it functionally, it, it, it's, it impedes your, your handling, right? But there are other issues, like the pommel size on several of their models. I think number two, your number two, and your number three, the Exandria, <laughs> and your number nine, which is the uh, Crusaders. They all, all have the exact same uh, pommel, wheel pommel, that is very thin and very small in diameter. And if you knock on it, you immediately find out it's hollow, partially hollow, because usually, you know, it's it's the, the sound it makes right, elsewhere is different. On that sort, it's different. So the pommel is really light in weight, and that really upsets the balance. And if you look at all of these models I just mentioned, they have really far point of balance, right? And it doesn't necessarily their blades are bad, even though there are issues. And just I think there they need to again, you need to find someone who understand your swords, European swords, to handle those and tell them the problem, right? Like you. If you tomorrow you you, sh you switch those wheel pommels right to another design that's bigger and denser and instantly it, you improve their handling by at least like fifty percent right but but that's not the the, the only issue you, you also have the consistency issue uh, I, I I look at their stats during the um, production run, uh, not the production run, the uh, prototype run I got the um, measurement from Philip Martin. So there's a very consistent distal taper on the Alexandria sword. And the one I got, which is like three years into production run, there's far less distal taper. And I also look at the, the blades on Kyle and some other people's very detailed measurement. It's not just like, oh, I have measured the base, I measured the tip and that's it. No, they, people measured it like every few inches, like six inches. And it just, there's not a lot of distal taper anymore. So there is there's no surprise that their, their swords feel chunky and compound compound that with the the issue with uh, pommel mass. Like people say it's not there to counterweight, which is nonsense, right? You shouldn't rely on that on the counterweight to make a good sword. You need to do that in the blade, right? Have the correct mass distribution. Yet still you need to have the correct size for the pommel. And it is all relevant to the blade. Like you have an Alexandra sword that's very imposing, like over three inches wide at the base. You, you simply cannot have the same exact pommel as a, as a much, much narrower sword, right? So it just shows- You bring like that a, up, it's interesting you, you mentioned that one, Kane, because many, many moons ago, um, the, the Ronin Katana Type 18C, I think it's the Model 3, I can't, I can't three remember. 3-2, yeah. Um, you review so I, I had I had that one and at a point of balance that was much higher up the sword than the Alexandria from Dark Sword Armory. And I took a full pound of weight, as I recall, or something thereabout. And I, I had these little like metal cylinders that fit just in the uh, kind of the the hollowed out area. And I stacked them so that it added about a pound of weight in addition to the sword on the pommel. And it moved the the it moved the point of balance down, I think like an inch, like it was still like seven inches. It was still way further up than the, than the Albion was. Um, even though yeah, they weighed. I think there's also, yeah, but the, I did move it, right? And also it, there's a, you have to do the correct distal taper and yeah. the can, the can size. I'm, I'm just saying oh. that the, the pommel weight doesn't, um, you, you have to move it out at the other end of the sword. You can, you can make that a, an impact with the pommel, but it's not gonna. Yeah, it's not I, gonna uh, yeah. buy you that much. It, yeah, it doesn't do that's that. Why well, but you still, you still need it, right? Like if you don't have yeah. it, like you can do everything else right, and it still doesn't balance in the correct way. But even if you make it, you still need to make other elements right correct, like the correct distal taper, the correct tan size, 
right? Like the grip lens because that shift the uh, the lens of the lever, right, out. And even just think like one inch difference in the in the in the grip lens. That's that's you have like a chunk of mass by the end. Think about like a lever. It, it's it's one inch yeah. of difference and make a huge you know impact. So you have to do everything right. Like but but, but that pummel is one of the biggest issue, and uh, it just like everything I've seen is suggests that they don't really they don't really know what what matters and they don't particularly I, care because you well, know it's, it's I, just I a good problem. Going after right? different things though. I, like I, I, Albion is, you know, you can see it in the writing. Peter Johnson uh, uh, makes a design, and they're well researched, and they're they're trying to make that historical design accurately, right? And martial artists happen to really like them, um, and collectors happen to really like them, but they have they have a goal that attracts multiple people. I think Ronan Katana is trying to make like durable swords. Uh, yeah. th it doesn't strike me that they're trying to attract HEMA practitioners or that they're trying to make a historical sword i think they're just trying to make a, a cool sword that happens to be european influenced in style right. um and so their their designs are all all heavily inspired that they, they fit certain typology like 12a like 13c right even like Alexandra sword is almost an ex they intended to be an exact copy of the sword at the Met metropolitan museum even the same etching, they get the same etching at the base, the Arabic etching. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's, yeah, it's it looks like it, but none of their ad copy or their advertising looks like none of these. I'm looking on their website right now, and I, I mean, I could be wrong here, but I don't. They say what it's made out of, and and you know, I think they're one of the based on what called of Athena said. They're they're honest about what their swords are made out of, so <laughs> they're one of the folks that passed the test. Um, but I don't see like ad copy in here that says we're making a type 18C. I, I think the one with the um, the etching in there does say it's, you know, trying to okay. make something yeah. look like it's that sword. It's a Harry Dean sword. Yeah. yeah. So here's a question for you guys that bounces off this point. So I'm kind of of the mindset when it comes to that, that they're taking, you know, historical inspiration. But like Matt said, I don't think they're exactly trying to copy historical handling because you know a thing that john and i talk about on our channel a lot is when you're doing something budget minded or mid-range you're going to cut corners somewhere and so how much of that is cutting corners and the handling and not putting in you know all the extra effort that it would take to make a sword that handles the way it does so like to me a lot of those swords you know i know the alexandria is a little bit more expensive but most of the european swords are under 300 dollars. so it seems like they're trying to make historically inspired swords that are functional and look cool not necessarily going to handle like their historic counterparts. And I guess my question for all of you is, at what price range do you let that go? Do you be like, hey, this isn't made for like hardcore enthusiasts so much as like somebody's entry level sword and at you know, $250, $260, how much of the handling do you let go? Do you not need it to feel like a historic counterpart? Because even the Alexandria, that's not a $1,000 sword. That's like a $350 sword. So how much does that matter to you? 400, Oh, okay, more expensive. Okay, well, it's getting up there. Okay, um, but still, how much does that matter to you guys personally? Like, is that a hard no if it doesn't handle like it's supposed to at so, you know, three hundred dollar um, ish? I'll go pretty quick because I think mine will be pretty quick. To me, the most important thing for a sword is handling. More important than looks. More important than uh, durability. I mean, to a degree, obviously, you needed to be heat treated and properly construct constructed. But the handling is the most important thing because if it's not fun to use, it's not fun to take out and swing, I don't want to own it. it it's not going to be something I'm ever going to want to use. So cut corners everywhere other than the handling and then proper construction. And I, I just want to add one more thing on Rona Katana is that if they took their grips and made them like the number 10, I think it is, I looked it up, the, the single hand or the two-handed saber, which is a more traditional grip. If they did that, I would probably have ranked them as B. But because most of their swords have just the god awful grip, that's why I put them all the way down in D. It For is me, number I, ten, Carl. Yeah, that's. I think this is the one. Yes, that's I want the to one. Try that one. It's it's uh, actually it's easily their from what I've seen the, their best Euro model. Which is funny because it's not particularly historic. <laughs> yeah, so the, the name is always weird, right? 
sort of thing. Number seven, like massive review is pretty good, right? Like the uh, type 18B ish. Yeah, that one right. seems pretty decent also. Yeah. I mean, I, I look at these and the, the reason that I uh, put them in the B tier was the value for what the intended use was, right? And so as as I've reviewed a number of, of things for Ronin Katana, and yeah, a lot of them have been Katanas, but a, a few of them have been European-style swords as well. And when I go to read, like, what is this for? Um, and what was the goal in making it, if I talk to Chris, who is the, the owner of Ronin Katana that sent them my way? He's like, you know, I'm trying to make a cool sword, but it wasn't... I'm trying to make this historic sword or recreate this thing from a museum. It was, you know, I, I picked what I thought looked cool. Um, and I made a sword that I, I would want. Uh, and then it's advertised when there are additional details. There's like, this is for backyard cutting, right? And the, the backyard cutting in, in the folks that are, are doing it are cutting water bottles and maybe tatami mats, but probably like branches and stuff. And when I went out to go and test these swords, they held up to that kind of activity uh, really, really well. In contrast to other swords, because bear in mind, like the the stuff that I was I was sharing was two hundred bucks, three hundred bucks. You know, I went and whacked a branch with a Topeka sword, and it broke. Uh, I whacked the, the Quillian on the Topeka sword, and it shattered. Uh, the the Dark Sword Armory Quillian, I think, got better, but the one of them broke, and that was quite a bit more expensive. Um, the Windless Battle Cry Viking sword that I tested uh, broke at the hilt. Granted, that made it much further in the in in testing but eventually it had a, a pretty catastrophic failure where it shouldn't have and all the ronin swords for you know i i do agree agree the grips could are are the single point that could have used the the most attention um but they held up to doing the thing that they were intended to do and at a price that i mean some of these euro swords are like 160 bucks the <laughs> two, 200 bucks for some of these Those swords are the scratch and dent ones though if they're that inexpensive, those are scratch and dent, which uh, might have some issues. Yeah, the, the, okay, the, it looks like the non scratch and dent uh, type 18C is 450. That's still half the cost of the Dark Sword Armory, and it's similar in features. But the um, problem is that's pretty close to the LKHN one, though, the Balor Arms one is, a, in my opinion, a better yeah. option now. But, but the rest of them are very cheap, though. You know, in, in fairness, you, you bring up something pretty solid here because this, uh, I, I don't see it here now, but I want to say they had like a single handed arming sword. There, there so here's a, a, if you go, here's actually, a, if you go back, Matt, there was, I did see one. It was that top right. Top right. Yeah, scratch and dent. Oh. Yep, that's the, that's the Viking sword. Um, I was just thinking if I compared them to the LK Chen one, this, uh, this thing is probably the closest. So 275 versus closer to 500. If you ask me which one would I want to go whack branches in the backyard with, mm. I would choose this over the LK Chen sword. But if you were asking me which one do I think swords better at doing sword things, which are not mm. axe things, then that LK Chen sword is something that I would I would say is far and away <laughs> quite, quite a bit. Feels more nimble. Which one would I want to fence with? Which one would I would I want to like actually use for for any kind of Non backyard durability focused task would be the LK Chen. But if you are looking for something that is going to take a licking and keep on ticking, um, which I, I think a large amount of the, the people that buy Ronin Katanas are looking for that. And so it's, right. uh, if you wanted a zombie tools by by contrast, like that would be $600 or right. more. So, and they tend to hold up similarly. Yeah. So I, I found that to, if they were selling it as a historic European sword, geared to achieving a certain um you know a certain set of specifications for for that typology or something i'd say you missed the mark but if you're like you go hit stuff with it <laughs> yeah and I see like what you're European sword, I and it, yeah, yeah but then i i give them a little bit more grace now dark sword armory doesn't do that and i i don't mean to keep going back to them but they write out like hey here's the sword we're trying to make and here's the history behind it and you know, mm -hmm. you, you can you can look at that and say, like, ah, that doesn't seem to mesh with the typology as I understand it. Ronan's not doing that. They're like, it's made at 1075. Go hit rocks. No, they don't they don't encourage rock hitting, but NDSA they don't throw a fun in the backyard. Incidentally, they do hit rocks pretty well. I I 
I remember I got sick of hitting a rock with it. I, I started throwing rocks at it. <laughs> and it, and it See, still held up. That's the so, thing. I think Ronan and Katana, the Euro line, they're going for a different thing. And like, there's not a whole lot of like decently made European sword options under three hundred dollars, right? So, do you do you give grace to a company when they're when they're not trying to make the thing you want? It's like I I love things that are made like the historical things they're they're trying to emulate. But if if somebody like Zombie Tools, for example, just goes off in their own direction, but admittedly makes it for a different purpose, do you consider that when you when you put them in a tier that they're making things that are, you know, not, not really for you, but still good at the target they're going for. Again, yeah. I didn't do the homework, but I would. Yes. I think, <laughs> I, think I, I see what you're saying and I agree. And to answer Vic's question, uh, like how I'll handling is the one singular, you know, criteria I, I value the most probably takes a 60 to 80% of the consideration. What, they function as a specific sword they are inspired by or like trying to directly emulate right if it doesn't really handle like a sword like why are we looking to history because history is real mm -hmm. history is what makes swords practical mm -hmm. and realistic because it's what really happened now you have different kinds of swords because they have different purposes some are cavalry swords some are more like infantry combat swords some are dueling swords some are war swords that's okay right some are anti armor swords those are for different purposes but mostly what had happened with you know the use of cold steel i'm talking about you know melee handheld weapons have happened like in the future like in you know 40 40 000 years in the future right like we might revisit these weapons and they might have new uses but they are still within the realm of handheld weapons, right? And they will fit into one of these categories. Are they primarily anti-flesh? Are they primarily anti-armor, right? And it just, it has to fit the parameter, or even today, right? They were talking about survival situations or self-defense, right? Home defense, like these has to be considered. So handling is one singular, like obviously you can be, like if I, I swing your sword around as it breaks in half. That that's not gonna do, right? <laughs> but I, I don't worry about those because how many production companies are gonna output those? So my rating, final rating of, of rolling katana is C, which is I said is tragic. It's exactly between Matt's and Kyle's, right? So it's for me, it's neither a B or nor a D, because like it has they have their place, right? And the way I view it is that they could have been so much more easily, easily. The potential right? was there. But as it are, as it, like if I rank Hanway B, right? Like we, we mostly agree that Hanway will be B. But if you take Hanway Tinkerline, you know, the long sword, the bastard sword, the, the, the Norman sword, the, the, the Viking sword, the great sword of war, every single one of them, right? They are, they are sold for $250 or so, right? So in most cases, more more affordable than than, than the only ones. Like they're just better source. Like mm -hmm. they're also quite a bit more fragile them. though, Kane. Like a, a lot of people have broken their their Hanway Tinker swords at the hilt. They've had some flaws. They they, they have... come apart and they can uh, you know be customized. And there's a lot of really endearing, awesome things. I'm not trying to uh, shit on the the Hanway Tinker line because I I like it. But I would say that like those handle like swords, but they break like swords too, right? Like you have you have yeah. historical and proportion, that, but the the battlefield was littered with broken blades, right? So Ronan Katana's yeah, don't though. Yeah, I I I showed one of the example of someone literally catching a Tan Wei longsword, like just just sparring sword, broken on when they are filming, bam, and shattered at the grip because they have a design issue at the the uh, shoulder of the tent, right, where it transitioned into the narrower width, is square. So they fixed that pretty, pretty, pretty fast. After that, I think it took about a few months. All the batches, newer batches, they have very rounded shoulder. So that that got resolved. But there's no question that if you use them to whack, I don't say whack rock because it's not a intended usage, right? But 
Let's say just win posts. Right? Like, yeah. I, I, like, I think as a backyard cutter, though, like what I, I, we probably are aware of what happens when you abuse a sword and, and therefore are more loath to do it with our treasures. But um, the the Hanway Tinker line is, is much more likely if you want to whack two by fours in your backyard, which because of the dumb things I do on the internet, people are, are more comfortable sharing with me what they do when it's dumb. And there are a lot of people out there that like to cut branches that you might not think a sword should cut or that just test their swords on two by fours to, to see if they're good or bad. Um, and I, I would hazard a guess that the Tinker line is, is going to hold up to that kind of activity worse to a person that values it. But here's a counterpoint. You can buy a Tremoltina machete for, for $20. And it's going to hold up even better than the, the rolling katana one. And it's going to chop branches better than the sword because will. you use far less energy. But that's to counter that, right? if you want a sword, that's not a sword. Like if you want something with a cross guard and a pommel and a but then, But then you're you're not really using the sword as a sword if you chop tree. No, but the point, but right? to circle back, I think there is a, a group of people or market for wanting an entry level sword to just go out and do dumb things with. And to me, I get it. Like, I, I think your ability is. If you if you look at the dumb <laughs> shit, I or you're gonna like, miss the yeah. stand, which we do. You're it. gonna hit the stand, like we do a lot. <laughs> we we probably have a should have a, like a separate list for you know beaters because yeah, you know, the Hanos be are definitely better beaters than Hanway and. Here's a here, here, here's a it's better they are better beaters than zombie tools, right? Because they handle better than zombie tools. By the way, Kane, like, I just want to point out I love you so yeah. much because we posted that one video and you got into like a comment war with uh, the one dude about the dipos not being able to hold up that well. I was rolling laughing so hard at that. Like, well played to you, sir. That was impressive. <laughs> you literally okay, are like, no, you're wrong. Right. Shut up, Sasaki. Like, you're being really nice about it. But now I'm going to tell you why you're wrong. <laughs> Apologies <laughs> to that person if they're watching. Ah, uh, but that was that was very entertaining. It just, I don't, I don't think like Ronin, Ronin swords are going to be held, held up longer than Zombie Two. Probably not, not as much. Mm -hmm. But they are, but they are more energy efficient, right? If you're, you're, set, you set out to cut down some branches, right? It might. You're, you're gonna might hold use up less longer. energy with, with right? I've I've broken more than a few of them, and they are, and I've broken a zombie tools, uh, and so I I would say they are. Uh, the zombie tools might have it by a little bit. The zombie tools is going to hold up to being like uh, solid in other ways. If I just think of like how how many strikes against a tree is it going to take to break a sword, you know, use that a weird measure. They probably wouldn't be all that dissimilar, but like the cross guard and stuff are naturally a little bit more fragile and it's going to fall apart, you know, wiggle a little quicker yeah. and the handle will likely disintegrate because it is not uh, particularly well made. But I think if you buy something from from Ronin and you're handy and can make a grip yourself, uh, there's there's a little bit more opportunity to at least have a blade that isn't a giant piece of garbage. Uh, in that price point. And if you're handy with a grinder and don't mind like filing off some weight, not that that's something that I would personally feel comfortable doing, but I, I think you, you for relatively little money uh, can get something that has potential to be quite good or at least, you know, not be a, a poorly heat treated uh, and generally poorly shaped blade. But I, we we can we can go on ad nauseum. Maybe we we talk about something that we're in a little bit more agreement on. Uh, let's see, LK Chen is is one. Uh, so Kyle, you didn't you didn't rate LK Chen, but it sounds like you've had a Euro sword made by them, but it was I, Balor Arms. Yes, and therefore I rated it under Balor Arms, not LK Chen, especially because. The Balor Arm Swords are not LK Chen designs. I don't feel like I want to. I, I don't want to lump those together because one of them is them acting as a contract forge, and one of them is them designing and bringing the sword to realization. I do have a Munich Town Guard from them that is in customs right now, so I will have something from them at some point, and I am really looking forward to that. But 
at this point, no, I, I don't have, I have experience with plenty of other LK Chen swords. They sent me a box of like 10 different Chinese swords that I'm slowly doing videos on that eventually will be sent you, on to somebody else. But if not you only really. think about the, the contrast then between the LK Chen, because I think you've had a sword made by LK Chen for Balor Arms, but then that same sword made by a different contractor for Balor Arms. Have you had the yeah, LK Chen and that other one? So if you just think about the, forego any of the design side of things, but just their execution on one interpretation and then LK Chen's interpretation, would you be more comfortable rating them in that regard? In terms of their ability to meet specs and uh, put together the sword properly and all that, I don't have any questions about LK Chen. I would definitely rank them uh, right up at a A. But I'm not going to give them a full ranking without seeing, without totally, truly totally fair. It. We're we're shooting from the hip a little bit, but I think in in that regard, like LK Chen, uh, what I think I've only had European swords from them that were made under the the Balor Arms brand, the the Messer and the um, obviously I've had their Chinese swords and then the the arming sword. But they are, uh, it seems like, generally positive. It, it sounds like your your comments around their capability to assemble things is positive. I, Kane, you you gave them a uh, an S tier. That's pretty high yeah. praise, right? Right in the, you know, uh, among the the top makers. I I also gave them a very high rating. That I I thought quite highly of them. Um, even though there was room for improvement on the the Kriegsmesser and stuff, it seems like they. They copied some of the wrong answers from somebody else's homework a little bit, but uh, generally they didn't speaking, copy it. Colosina <laughs> copied it. <laughs> They're just they they the right answers. Yeah, they, they they did some things that were really good with that sword, but like there were also some things that it seems like LK Chen could have probably caught, like using the nagel with a around uh, around peg and have it spin around. Like they, they've they've gotten. They've had the ability to do some some smart things with other designs. Uh, it seems like there were there were some things that I would I would have liked to to see them catch. I would have I, I would have yeah. thought that would be a little bit more I, fitting. I, I will say for their Valor Arms work, um, their rep KK told me that they were they had no say in the design at all. They were purely okay. making the swords based off the very detailed specs that Cult of Athena gave them. So. I'm not sure if it's fair to them to say that they should have caught that, especially when you consider that it's not a sword they have experience type that they have any experience with before that. You know, they've no Chinese swords that I'm aware of had a nagel or anything resembling a nagel. Mm -hmm. That's a that's a good point, Kyle. That's fair. That's a fair thing. If it was designed to have a round peg in the round hole with the thing that's going to get whacked and then turns into a fidget spinner, then, then damn it, they delivered. Um, so, but what they did it, better than cold steel that, I mean, if it was the same thing, cause they look like the same sword, mm -hmm. uh, it held up better. I like the, the casting designs. I thought everything was put together and the heat treated it. Well, I did some dumb things with the tip of that thin little thing and it, it held up quite well. And this other arming sword that I have Kane, you, you, I think when you mentioned the Templar sword said, this would be a sword that you'd be happy to pay a thousand dollars for. I'll be uh, happy to pay three thousand dollars. I I don't know if I agree with you there, I, I but cut, I would say that it cuts above its weight. I, I cut the the way I, I was looking for a, a very historically accurate ten A, right? Which is extremely rare. You're gonna find very good ten A from makers like Angus Trim. He does like twenty models, different models of ten A, where they're very atypical. They're not like the the most historically representative 10 A's, right? And they are gonna handle like a dream, but they're not. Because 10 A's are usually lenticularly in cross section, very long fuller until, you know, this is a 10 A, until almost at the tip. And they have to have a very dramatic distal taper because there's not a lot of, you know, profile taper. And they are they should be very long in the blade and this, like Angus Trim doesn't do very long blades. And and I was that fits every single bill by that. And and, and the furniture, right? Like the wheel pummel. 
By the way, it's tapered. The wheel pummel is tapered. How many of the wheel pummels are tapered in thickness? On source, you, you, you sold for under one thousand dollars. Not, right? Just I'm gonna tell you, it's not. You're not gonna find any, right? Every part of it, it looks austere, but if you look at the details, they are completely accurate. You go to the record of medieval sword by your Oksha. You look at 10A, that looks like every 10A, every original sword, and the distal taper on that one is off the chart right like is there's like 70 percent right so the tip near the tip the blade is 70 percent 75 percent thinner than the base you're not going to find it on any sword under one thousand dollar you're not going to find you're going to find many right on source above that price range and then here's the usage i took it to the um Hima club in um in vancouver and it cut like what when I I cut it with a shield, right? A big kite shield, not kite shield, a heater shield. I could cut it, and where the mat just got left on there, it's so clean that it wouldn't fall off. Like I can I can just walk away, and gradually maybe there is some vibration on the floor, and it it falls off. And it's just not once, right? Several times, I I was really floored. I wow. Like I didn't, I, I didn't know how to expect, you know, I, I know it's historically accurate. But I don't know what to expect when, when I go to cut with it, especially with a shield, you know, with cutting with shield is pretty difficult. You can actually accidentally, you know, bump your, your fingers onto the shield and smash it pretty good. I did that before and that sword, oh my gosh, it's, it's like a dream. And I, I did some double cuts. I think he has videos. <laughs> It's a one or two, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I it's, it on I, it's magical, really. And then the other bottle arm source, right? The Grease Messer, uh, the Alexandria, easily the best cutter under $1,000. Easily. Mm. Like the others, not even if, if those two are here, right? The others are maybe here, right? The best of them are here. Right? So, but still, like I, I totally, totally get that that you said there was some issue with the Nago placement, right? But it's only because they didn't like let them examine, examine an antique Greek master, right? Don't mm -hmm. just say, don't just be Jeff Bezos. Give me Game of Thrones, yeah. But what are the ingredients, mm -hmm. right? But even if judging by the little they are given, they did they did like a phenomenal job, right? So it just tells you. The caliber of this maker, and then I handle right. like their their Saxony rapier. That's that's under their house brand. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that how oh, okay. So how 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 well can rapier cut? So I use it on a ballistic gel side and lock, right? So ten pounds of ballistic gel in a in a jug that's about the same same thickness as a quadruple tatami mat, right? And put a wooden dowel in the center, cut it in half. Mm -hmm. cleanest cleanest cut ever like it, it cut it better than the albion maximilian <laughs> what that that's really i is stop to compute i also appreciate the cane your comment on i think it was a facebook post or somebody was talking we posted a video review of that one and like a rapier can't cut and you were just like wait until i post my video because i'm going to show you a rapier can freaking cut and uh, oh, my so again, I did, do, <laughs> I did do the homework, but if I did, I would give LK Chen an A. And uh, my only complaint with the Saxony German Rapier was just the sandblasted finish on the hill. Literally, that was the only thing I didn't like about it. Everything else about that sword was freaking phenomenal. And talking about the LK Chen uh, Balor Arms uh, Euro swords, you know, I have the Alexandria, the Kriegsmesser, and the Italian. All of those are phenomenal swords. Like the Alexandria you know, Kane, you know, we did a, a collab on that video and we were talking about, you know, that also has dimension in the pommel and like just the way that thing moves for how big and wide it is. It's unbelievable. The Kriegsmesser, you know, I often have people coming in my house that have never played with swords before and like they want to try stuff and like just if I'm looking for like bang for buck, put something in someone's hand that will blow their mind, I give them that Kriegsmesser. And, you know, maybe it doesn't have the oomph that, you know, or like some of the mass that, you know, a, a Kriegsmesser should, you know, watching your guys' collab on that sword. 
but damn, that thing is fast. And it feels like a one handed sword. And with the Italian, I love that sword also. My biggest complaint is that's the one where the grip is just not very good, even compared to the Alexandria. Um, but again, I'm probably going to send that to Matthew Cross and get that rewrapped. And when it, I do, it's going to look like a much more expensive sword. So I, I do think that with would they get the specs, like what they can do with that, they make great products. But also, if they're just left alone to make their own stuff, it seems to be phenomenal. Like the Rodaldo, Robaldo, Rodaldo, the Type 19 that you have, Cam. Yeah, yeah. That's something I still want to get because that looks fantastic. Um, so, and like, John, our plan is I have the winless 1796 Saber. John's going to get the LK10 1796 Saber, and we're going to compare those and see like how good those are in terms of like competition to each other. So, every time they come out with a new Euro Sword, I'm intrigued. Kyle, you have that Town Guard coming, and what you think about it is going to directly influence on whether or not I buy that. So. Yeah, even when like you're in the review business, I'm still waiting for other reviews to come out sometimes. <laughs> it's still a lot of money. <laughs> Kane, I wanted to... Oh. Yeah, go ahead. I was going to say, I wanted to say something when you were talking about the Templar. Um, LK Chen did a, obviously did a phenomenal job with the billing design there, but we have to give some props, some serious props to Cult of Athena's designer on that sword especially yeah. because... You know, you were talking about how uh, perfectly it represents a 10A, and that's purely based on their design. So, you know, yeah. really good job on that one in particular. And it definitely seems like they are their designers improving. And at this point, the Balor Arms by LK Chen is probably the best buy for under 500. That's bang for both. any of the any of the models that I'm aware of. Yeah, I've, yeah. I've only had the um, well. I've had the the Kriegsmaster, the the Templar sword. Even though uh, I'll admit I don't particularly like that like style of sword. Generally speaking, I don't gravitate to it. Um, but that one in particular, yeah, because I've, I've it's this. It's a very uh, prolific style of sword. There's there's a, a fair number of reproductions or attempts at them anyway. And um, as I think about the the Deltons that I've had and uh, Dark Sword Armory and Ronin and, you know, all of these like sub $500 varieties of arming swords, it's one of the first ones that I picked up that made me go, oh, shit, like, I actually, like, I like this. This this is nice. Um, and, like, I felt like I could move it. It didn't feel kind of derpy in the hand. Uh, that That is, uh, that specifically the Templar sword, the, the Kriegsmesser, uh, is fun and it it is you know n easy to cut with and you know kind of a delight to use. But if you're a sword nerd, then that that Templar sword is is really nice. Uh, there's just like it's really really nice and and surprisingly fun and just puts a smile on your face and also makes you feel like your your money is is pretty well spent. Mm -hmm. I say that even though the one I have has problems. Uh, <laughs> The one I got, the it has an LK Chen scabbard problem. It's the same thing that happened to the Chu Jin I got from LK Chen, uh, where the scabbard just wants to eat the sword. So like I got it and it was had a little bit of gap in it. And I should preface this by saying the the folks at Cult of Athena went to their warehouse and took out like ten other swords and sent me a video of all of them going in and out of the scabbard just fine. They unwrapped the other ones they had in stock and they made sure it didn't have the problem that I had. So what I'm saying. If you buy one based on this this uh, conversation, don't don't worry that you, you <laughs> I have video proof that you won't have it from the other ones they have in stock. Um, but uh, so also tip of my hat to Cult of Athena for doing that because that was pretty cool. Uh, but it, the one that I got for some reason, like it got stuck in the scabbard and I had to take a hammer to bang it out of the scabbard, <laughs> otherwise it won't come. And now it like sits like eight inches of it won't go won't go in the in the scabbard. And even with that. Like even with that problem, the the also the leather has like it looks like it's been trimmed, and so some of the stain uh, isn't present on the ends of the leather around where they transition to the uh, the pommel and the the stuff. So there's like these little things, but even with that, even with basically an unusable scabbard, still absolutely worth five hundred dollars. There's the you only had to watch this for two hours to get the punchline of a review that will also take me two hours to go through. I'm sure. I think uh, that sword's 400, by the way. Yeah, 398. 
Yeah. Tip them a hundred dollars, you'll still be happy. <laughs> yeah, you guys are yeah. The money you spent. Uh, you guys are convincing me that I'm gonna have to buy one. I've been wanting one forever, and when Ken got one, I was so jelly. Yeah, the uh, Andy of the Electrics stores. He's been he, he's on the waiting list, and now he finally got one. He, he bought one. He bought one. Yeah. Yes, he, he did. Had, uh, dream comes true. I saw and, it in. Uh, uh, I have to talk about that Ribaldo. I forgot that one. How can I forget that one? That's the first. Quick, before you mention that, I want to say I did see the Templar sword in the background of one of Matt's recent videos, and I was like, "That's not here, a one too." Here it I is. That one. Here it is. <laughs> and go ahead. Yeah. There. You don't realize there's just piles of swords, and they're, they're everywhere. Yeah. I was in a meeting earlier today, and somebody's like, "Do you like swords?" And then, like, I showed a picture of the closet, and they were like, "Ooh." Anytime my girlfriend says I have too many swords, I show them. The three of you guys is just set up, and I was like, "No, I don't have enough swords." <laughs> yeah, uh, that's so, all. Yeah, mm -hmm. and you know what? That, that's that that Templar is actually. If you think about the complexity, it can't even compare to LK Chance Ribaldo, right? Because the Ribaldo is a Type 19 sword. That point of balance is not straight out, right? That's a me. That's the. The ratio, the weight to size ratio, that has a 37 long, 37 inch long blade. And it weighs like less than two pounds. Mm -hmm. And and you would think that something this lightweight will not perform well, right? Like it's it's fast, but it's not gonna perform well. But it's it got a truckload of authority in the cut. Mm -hmm. And you just slice and dice, but it captures it, it's not just like a a practitioner's piece. You look at the collector's value, the 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 way they capture type 19 source, right? And, and by the way, it's it's based off Matt Eason's like precise measurement of a uh, Christie's you know, auction piece. And now now at the Metropolitan Museum, that they did a, like a phenomenal job. But, you know, and it's just not just they did a, like a complete replica of like that that one sword which is already already like mind blowing it's just the kind of performance mm -hmm. you can have with that sword well so, i think like when you you hadn't quite posted your review yet i think you posted that you got one i remember i messaged you privately and like asked what you thought about it cuz i was thinking about buying one and you told me that how oh, it's a phenomenal sword but if you've never had a type 19 before just to be aware of what a type 19 feels like you're like it, it doesn't handle like a type 18. It is a very, very different animal. And while I still haven't gotten that one, you know, I did get the Kern, the Albion Kern, which is also a type 19. And you're right, like type 19s, the, the point of balance is so far out there. Like with the first, you pick it up, like you take it up off the wall, you're like, this is so light. And then when you actually grip it, you're like, oh, wow, that is a lot of blade presence and you don't think it's going to handle well. And then you go cut with it. And once you kind of get a hang, the hang of it, once you get the fuel for like how that's supposed to move, Holy crap, it was such a good cutter. As I can imagine, like I saw your video on the Rodaldo, like that thing was slain through, you know, you had uh, meat on there that you were just yeah. chopping through and stuff like that. So, Gambison. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like, it, and you know, that circles back to a point you guys were making earlier where it's like, what's the intended purpose? You know, like a big 12A war sword's not going to handle like an 18B for agility, right? Like it's a, oh, you got the dodge, you doge. Oh. oh. Not oh, oh. So much. oh, that's so pretty. Not mine, it's not yours, but you but you gotta handle it. Nice. You get to review it. Yeah. Oh, that's pretty. That's one I've I've it was that the current and the Machiavelli. Like, there's no wrong choice there. Like they're all so good, pretty and so distinct. Yeah. And these these type 19 swords by Albion, they're just oh. different. They uh, like I I I mentioned this in my um Albion section of the tier list is that the, the next generation line caters to you know the majority of the audience like practitioners right martial artists so you really want some kind of handling traits that's that appeals to the modern audience you shouldn't have like a point of balance seven inches uh, seven inches from the guard but mm -hmm. like think about lk chance that that example that type 19 sword it's a 37 inch long blade, and that's on the original. Small hilt, 37, 37 inch long blade. And still, like you would think that, oh, that, that's so light and so long, it's gonna be a noodle, right? But 
but it's not. It's it's performs performs even better than some of the you know earlier like type type twelve source. Right, but you're so, right in that it's also like expectation. Like, what is the design purpose of this type of sword? It feels right. and handles exactly like this type of sword should, which is radically different than what some users might be used to. Also, a big shout out to Matthew Krauss for rewrapping that grit for me. It's so pretty. Shameless plug. Check out my review of that Kern. Yeah, shameless plug. Uh, it's the only one out. He did that one too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Shameless plugs all around. Yeah. So Matt, I noticed uh, you're gone for, for a bit. Yes, my my camera battery died. Um, oh. Okay. So the the thing I have, uh, I guess it it was like nope. So <laughs> I had to change the battery quick and yeah. get back on. You left and the image. I, do it, I, have to like, I was worried. Yep. I, you left I just, and we I, all brought out our type 19s. <laughs> yep. Because yeah. so you just, know I hate type 19. No, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm just curious, like, if, uh, Vic, if, if you are to rate Dalka Chan, where, which tier would you? Uh, if I'm the Euro stuff and even the Chinese stuff, so I actually probably have more experience with the Chinese stuff, but that's not what we're talking about. Euro stuff, I put them in an A. Um, I think they make really, really phenomenal products, whether that's the Bella Arms line where they're just given specs or in just my limited experience where they're making their own thing. I do think they're fit and finish, like stuff like that kind of stops me from putting them S tier. Um, and also, with and this obviously might be Cult of Athena with their specs. We talked about the, you know, the. Alexandria, the Italian, and I think you even said the uh, the German longsword might be a little lighter and like a little thinner in terms of distal taper than they should be. Now that translates to a super fun sword usually, and that's great. Maybe not the most historically accurate. And to me, like the grip does leave some things to be desired. Like you were saying, Matt, on both my Italian and my Alexandria, it's not dyed at the top and bottom. So you see some brown left over. My Italian specifically has dye stains on the under part of the guard and the pommel and, but whatever, like I'm getting phenomenally handling good looking swords for, you know, under five and under $300. So to me, that puts them at the A tier because they handle phenomenally. They're great swords. They come with scabbards. I know that their customer service is going to be spot on because we've dealt with them before. So yeah, I, I would put them at an A. It also has to be said that um, they are the only company, not the only company, but they are the, the company that's the most willing to take customer feedback and yes. improve them. And that's the, you know, it's sometimes it's even like a, like a drawback of buying a source because you buy a source, it's a pretty good one. And you're not even sure like one year from now, they, they got a revision from that one. You so almost you pay, don't want to be. And they don't even check out the price and you pay mm -hmm. the, the price and later on, they keep other people right. can pay the same price and it's, it's admittedly better. And now you, yeah. you just look at their, their websites, they just updated the scabbard for a few models. And it was yeah, Alexandria. so much prettier than before. And, well, and, and they, they also updated the false edge on that one of their you know, Chinese style. And I think, mm -hmm. well, if you got an earlier iteration, what, what you're going to do? Like, are, can you turn it in for a yeah. new, yeah. For a new, new scabbard? New scabbard? Right. <laughs> well, and uh, like Kyle, like, you know, your Italian longsword was what, two pounds, six ounces, seven ounces, somewhere around there, maybe eight ounces tops, I think it was, um, you know, and then they revised their website to show two pounds. I remember their website said two pounds, six ounces. Then they revised it and it said two pounds, 10 ounces. The sword I have is two pounds, 15 ounces. So again, like it definitely seems like they're listening and making that profile taper wider and wider and wider because the profile taper of my sword versus Kyle's sword looked radically different and you're right like that's listening to feedback so and there's uh, I, I can't hear you is your mic working well kyle's checking that out i thought i'd point out that lk chen we've got a, a few more participants now 23 right. and lk chen is, is seem seemingly hovering mostly between s and a uh seems to be the the large right. amount of feedback that folks have have said on it and the other somehow thing, my, sorry, go ahead. Somehow Kyle. I got muted, uh, Matthew. I'm not accusing you, but uh, um, <laughs> did I did I yeah, hit the wrong mute? I don't you didn't do it. Two pounds, fifteen ounces is a much better weight for that sword, Vic. And the one I had was two pounds, just under nine ounces. Okay. 
yeah, two pounds 15, it still feels like almost a one handed sword. Like that sword is so freaking agile with such good tip control. Like that's what that sword should weigh, I, I think personally, but what do I know? What other um, manufacturers? Because we've been going for a minute now. Um, and I, I'm going to, I have a better half who's going to come in and give me a little bit of side eye eventually. Uh, what other, uh, Incidentally, chat. I know I've neglected you, but if if anyone has any suggestions about things they'd they'd like to hear about, I, I kind of touched on the ones that I was I was most curious about, other than maybe talking about Angel Sword. But I I don't know that I have the energy to get in the can of worms any more tonight. <laughs> um, Some, somebody in chat was asking about Sword Ear, and I promised to, to talk about them a little. So this is one. This is a Sword Ear long sword that is on loan to me by a friend. He bought it from them, they shipped it to him, and he just shipped it directly to me without even opening it and said, review it when you have a chance. So thank you to Frank, I believe his name was. Sorry, I don't remember because it's on Discord and it was just an alias. But this, my, my very initial impressions of this was, that's a lot better than I thought it was gonna be for, I think it's $300. It, it's very much a Chinese inspired Euro sword. The blade geometry, it looks more like a Jian than a long sword. But initial impressions are quite good. It's very loud, uh, sword wind producing, nimble. It has distal taper, pretty. Um, not a huge fan. This is just like a cord wrap. Um, but really not bad at all for. My initial impressions, $300. Now, I, I, I hate to give initial impressions on swords because until they've gone through the full review process that I have, I don't find little niggling details that I dislike. You know, I don't get to nitpick the sword yet. And early impressions are oftentimes like, oh, that's nice. I like this. Whereas I want to really give it the full process. But so far, it seems pretty nice. And the price is definitely right. Nice. So, do you mind if I spill the beans a little bit? Mm -hmm. Hold on. Uh oh, drama! Hit us! Hit us! It Go for it! That, uh, don't take my word for it, but they seem to be the one that making the only katana your source. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, if you I if you look at the, um, hmm, what's that? I I think when you try to figure out who's making what in Long Tron, you're going to fail unless you're in Long Tron. And they in the are. They're making some swords that sold on Sword and Armory. And that exact same model that you're holding is, is available on Sword and Armory with a uh, named brand and also on uh, Age of Chivalry. So they make a bunch of, uh, you know, they, they started making a bunch of knockoff. Like when I say knockoff, it's like direct copy. So this is, you can't, you can't put them under any brand because you're, you're just going to get sued. They are knocking out uh, Albion uh, Burgundy, I think. It's just one-to-one -one, uh, knockoff of the uh, oh. Albion Burgundy. And this is also, yeah, the uh, Peter it's Johnson's uh, House of Dragon Sword. Was it like Dark Sister? Dark mm -hmm. Sister. Yeah. Dark Sister. This is just, just a direct ripoff. And so he ripped, oh, that's a shame. Yeah. So pretty. I, I'd have to have them next to each other. There's, there's a lot of influence, but I bet you'd, you'd probably poke apart some, <laughs> some details. Yeah. Um. But yeah, yeah. But, but they, they, but they look very interesting. It, it's just that some of these um, Chinese makers, they're not very ethical. You've seen some pictures of European swords, and I mean sometimes very very well regarded ones and they think they can oh make a make a knockoff of that but they miss some of the details mm -hmm. um and some people just have the the capacity to make a source like cloud hammer steel works right they're not ripping off anybody but if you look yeah. at their sword there if you look at cloud hammer steel works european swords oh that you look at that it's uh isn't that a direct copy of uh, not, not direct it's like an copy, Earl? Like a ripoff of uh, not quite, Earl? Kind of, yeah. Kinda it does like, look a lot like the Earl. Sense Doctor yeah. looks different, but it looks like the same thing. 
So Cl Cloud Hammer, yeah. I don't know if I've seen it like at RVA Katana in terms of what they have for sale, but uh, there there were some custom things that I think came out of the same forge that looked exactly like Dan Keffler's Super Assassin. Um, they were like little choppers that I think was a, a really specific design that I believe Dan Keffler made as a custom knife maker. I, I don't, I'm hesitant to call it ethical. I know it like intellectual property is well respected and, and seems to be a, a topic that is, uh, you know, we would, we would poo poo anyone for copying. Right. But I, I don't think like it, I, I don't think it has, it's held in the same regard or, or observed the same way in China. So I, I don't know that they think they're doing anything wrong, but yeah, like when I see, when I see Peter Johnson's work being copied, I'm like, Oh, Come on, my guy. <laughs> but uh, but Clawhammer, yeah. Um, Clawhammer still works. Does some pretty like unique. Like they're not ripping off anybody. Like Kyle received one and um, reviewed one, right? The the S five shock steel is that? Yes. Yeah. So they have some issues, but they they did a lot of things right. Like the profile is very European. <laughs> I, I think they um they don't they don't that, at least on that one they didn't have an idea of what such a fine tip should be like on a European sword. Yeah, because that's right. European sword long swords that had a, a very acute point would usually be thicker than that to make it more robust to be able to deal with chain armor or mail armor, whatever you want to call it, and just to not be delicate and that tip was delicate even though it, the sword was heat treated well and uh made of good steel and put together properly it definitely the tip geometry was not ideal so that's that's the same on on uh, the the one from uh the art of fire and iron art of iron and fire i get it mixed up Every time I, Matt, right? I think it's fire and iron. Fire and iron, yeah. I think they, they have a like a they have a lot of distal tapers, so resulting in a very thin tip. But when you have a very thin tip, it cannot be very narrow. If you have a very narrow tip, it cannot be very thin. And if you want a like a very large degree of distal taper, then by the end near the tip, you have to have a swell to reinforce the tip. So they didn't have that because they didn't know. What that tip is for so yeah i think both of you bent, bent those tips right <laughs> both of you. yeah I, mine was you, you know your tips, didn't you tell us the throwing story. it at a tree so i i think kyle you you had uh you, the tip bent uh doing a little more reasonable activity perhaps but i, the, I had put it in that i put the tip into some relatively green wood still and just did some light flexing and with the tip planted in the wood, it, it bent right at where it was planted. Hmm. Yeah. And if it was a more European style tip where it was a bit thicker, a bit more robust, there's no chance it would have done that. Yeah, I think this is why they need reviewers, right? Like they, they got a silhouette that the usual Chinese maker doesn't get the silhouette of the the European sword. They just think, oh, it's a, it's a Chinese gem. We make it wider, right? But then when they look at museum examples, oh, we need to have a very long transition to the tip, right? It's starting somewhere here, the type 18, right? type 15 kind, and transition from all the way from here, so resulting in a very narrow tip. But when you have that, you need to have a very thick tip. Uh, they, they, they need to send it out to reviewers and look at their offering and say, you can do everything, right? Like the distal taper and the transition to the tip. But then you need to make sure near the tip it swells up in thickness. So it, it's not very fragile. Let's see if I can get the camera to pick this up. This is the Munich, which is a great example mm. of the Albion Munich. It's very acute. Hopefully, camera will pick that up. You can it's, see that, uh, yeah, reinforced. Thick. It's not even reinforced. It just stays thick oh, all the way through there. It's I can make it easier for people to see, Kyle. Now that I know how not to just remove you from the stream when I want to focus on you. <laughs> so, you know, it's a very acute, but it it is a, a chunky tip. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
Yeah. On the uh, LB Lancaster, which is uh, which is a Type 15 arming sword. So very dramatic profile, taper like almost triangular. So the tip is very, very narrow. And also the blade is not very sick, right, overall, because it's, it's pretty wide at the base, right? like a very uh, pronounced triangular shape. And near the, the tip, it's just reinforced, right? The, the, the thickness actually, because there's a lot of distal taper, I think it's almost two millimeters thick, uh, thin, and then it swells up to maybe four at the tip, right? So that, that makes a lot of sense. You, they just need someone to to you know enlighten them to get there there is uh I, I imagine it can be done with with more than just reviews though i'm a little biased on that subject naturally the um uh having reference pictures reminds me of arms and armor though uh like i i had the schloss from arms and armor and it was a much earlier one and then they inherited oakshot's collection or the the oakshot institute came into like arms and armor and they could look at the exact you know one they were basing it off of and and see it in person in the you know it improved but as i as i examine the one that i have from before they owned the collection or you know before i don't know that they own it that's not the right word but before the oakshot institute was like integrated into arms and armor or at least in the same building uh it still more or less captured the spirit of that sword right and they were doing it from silhouette pictures and i think they had some measurements and stuff but they didn't they didn't have the other view of it and i remember uh chris poor <laughs> explaining that like hey we saw it from this one but not you know not really this one we didn't have have all the same information that we do when when you can go and handle the object right. but still managed to capture all of all of the important bits but i think that's because they had researched medieval swords and they knew a lot about it and i don't i don't know that that's I don't know how much of that is the case when, um, like, sword ear is, is manufacturing a, uh, a European sword, or if it's you know something that sells and that people are interested in and that they're interested in and want to do better at. I it, it does seem like things are drastically improving. I, I do recall some of the very early examples from like uh, like Musashi when they started making European swords and like the it was chunky and the pommel fell off and <laughs> it was. There's there's been a, a, a pretty uh, big improvement over the last couple of years and and some of the very affordable swords coming out of of China. So I hope I get a chance to check out what Swordier has myself sometime. Well, um, for those of you guys watching that haven't seen uh, Sterling Armory's series of videos about Oakshot typology, I highly encourage you guys to do that. He made a really good video about Type 16, and he was showing because you know some type some swords and different types look very very similar if you're just looking at pictures but then handle radically differently and so with type 16 he was showing pictures of type 14s and type 16s just with the 2d image he was just like all right can you guys pick which one is which and some of them were really really hard to pick from because they look so similar however if you pick them up they would feel radically different so just trying to like build a sword off 2d images is like eh, really really difficult yeah, to say like I think most of the people in the audience right now know this, but swords are 3D objects. Like you can, <laughs> you simply cannot. And here's a here's a part, right? Like if you look at some angles, you can easily figure out the 3D aspects, right? The geometries of hilt components, but it's not mm -hmm. really easy to figure out, you know, the distal taper, the mass mm -hmm. distribution. It's very easy for new people to come along and think, oh. Which is a you know steel flat, right? Like you grind down some some edges. Oh, wrong! It couldn't be further from the truth. You know, the cross section, the distal taper is is very, it's a it's a very delicate subject, and you need a lot of research for that to you know function the way you want them to be. And, and if you do it wrong, and like I I reviewed a Kanye function before, and I'm not sure whether you're familiar with that. It's the the broadest part of the function blade is three times mm -hmm. as wide as the base. So with that, you really need a ton of this paper to offset uh, that. Otherwise, it just it function, will right? swing like an axe. You know, it, will, it will swing like an axe. And the one I was sent to, you know, the example, it was pretty well made. It has a good amount of this paper, you know, from seven to three. 
usually that that would be good, right? But not good for that one. So if you look at, I'm using that sword, and I get, wow, <laughs> just I got carried around by that sword. <laughs> There's no recovery. Yeah, and we, we, it's so hard to accelerate that you feel you're basically when you're using it, you're at wit's end. You're at the limit of your capacity to properly maneuver that sword to align the edge, right? Even to well, not even do some curls. What's that? Just do, do some curls, you know, with yeah. some work, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> just, just do yeah. some squats, some curls, do a couple pull ups, push ups. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, I find a way. Working out like a normal person, yeah, yeah. But, but there are studio, studio objects that. You, know, you just show that you need to have very careful planning research. What uh, what other brands uh, before we call it an evening should uh, should be made mention? Kyle, you already called out Swordier, but uh, Kane, oh. Vic, you have. Did you guys talk about Valiant Armory already? Yeah. No. 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 Like on this stream. No, uh, yeah. no, no, we, we've, we, we've been, uh, pontificating a little bit more on the brand. So we've, we've gotten through like five out of a hundred. So I, I think I watched all your videos. I'm pretty sure you all give the mess here, right? Nope. Not nope. nope. Oh, you didn't have enough examples of them. That was why I, I was B, oh, nope. but that's because I, I only have when their production was in China to, to base things off of. You haven't had the Craftsman series or the vision line yet. You've had the, the signature mm -hmm. series. Right. You yep. definitely need to get a newer one, Matt. <laughs> I've I've been on the lookout. I've come close a couple times, but uh, I have not, and I and I don't know anyone that has one, so I haven't gotten a chance to like see one in person from another collector or something. Right. Um, I it it does look different. You know the the examples that I had though were were really early on, and the scabbard and leather work and the fitting quality really stood out from those. But at the same time, like the blades were floppy, or you know I don't they they absolutely when they were in that tier of product were a, a contender because okay. they were right. they were often around the same price as like a dark sword armory right. um but you got something that wasn't that <laughs> right well, that company yeah. no more right it's it's no longer the same company it, they so they, i, I they believe the same people are doing it but they exclusively make in the united states now and do yeah, the believe sunny has said yeah. that he will never yeah. never deal with Chinese blades again. He he had so many problems with quality control with the blades that they sent him that he, that's one of the primary reasons he went to manufacturing his own was because just so many quality control issues with the, the swords right. that he got from them. Kyle, you posted a video uh, after, I can't remember if it was SoCal or Combat Con one year, but you were talking about how so many people were walking by Valiant Armory's booth being like, what is that, Albion? And you're like, that hurts me in my soul. And I'm like, yeah, if I had a soul, it would hurt me there too, <laughs> because that's not okay. Because <laughs> yes, to me, they're S tier. Uh, this is the Craftsman Series Monarch. I have three of their Vision Line swords, and I think they are outstanding value for the money. I mean, the Craftsman Series range is what, 1200 to 1500 roughly, and you always get a scabbard with it. Vision lines are 12 to 14, a little bit like $500 more if you want the scabbard included in that. I think they have different scabbard options now. Um, as people probably know, the Vision line are based on Angus Trim models, but even the Craftsman series, I feel like are really slept on sometimes in the community. Like they are fantastic swords, maybe not the most historically accurate all the time, but they are phenomenal handling swords and were some of the first high-end swords. Like I started buying Valentine Armory swords before I even started buying Albion's. And then once I started getting Albion's, I was like, no, they're definitely, to me, on the very same level in terms of handling and fit and finish and all of that. So um, I don't want people to sleep on Valiant Armory. I, I, they definitely deserve uh, your attention if you haven't checked them out yet. I, I want to add one thing to that. I was at SoCal Sword Fight uh, this year, and Valiant Armory was there for the first time. And they had, I think, pretty much all their vision lines. They had the Exeter. Mm -hmm. Do you have that one, Vic? I don't, but I want okay. it. Um, if you if anybody here has handled a gust trim 12a sword they don't handle like anybody else's 12a's they are a very unique handling style of sword and when i picked up the exeter i said that's a gust trim sword yeah it, it is it felt exactly like the way gust trims 12a swords handle which like i said is completely unique in the world 
And then you get Valiant Armory's just absolutely gorgeous hilt work and beautiful scabbards as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They are like a different success story than Albion's model, right? Like they're basically, okay, we, we, didn't, we don't have much chances to examine originals. And, and like you said, like the fit and finish and the handling is basically on par with Albion, but they are working very closely with people like Angus Trim, who in turn work with a lot with practitioners like Philip Martin. So they basically, they design prototype and send it off to you know experts uh, to test cut with to handle and and have feedback you know what do you think of this do you like it do you, do you think we can do something different and it's all optimized for practitioners use okay. so it's it's really like a shame that they don't get enough exposure among practitioners they are very popular among collectors right but they're just mm -hmm. not they're not there yet in, in terms of the uh, reputation uh, among practitioners, and they shouldn't. Yeah, you know, especially the vision line. Yeah, the vision line are just some of the, to me like you get essentially the handling of an Angus trim sword, of an Angus trim sword with you know the hilts and the leather and the bouginess of a Valiant Armory sword. You know, because like I love my Angus trim swords, but as we could all probably agree, very uniform, very utilitarian, and the uh, the vision swords are just gorgeous all of them in their own unique ways so yeah that's such a good blend of being pretty and being really good you are starting I, to see the vision line pop up in cutting tournaments which should help nice i i like that they come yeah like, you review uh you review the angus trim type 19 uh type 12 type a right 12 a.19 yeah i know because i want that sword you didn't help i have that. one on the way do you did you order one yeah i have one it's actually at Ma uh, Matthew Cross for a scabbard. Nice. I, yeah, I, I did Matthew many, many Cross. years ago. Yeah, uh, Angus yeah. sent me a uh, uh, a sword, or a f I can't remember how many he sent. It's been a minute. Um, but yes, they are magical. And I've owned a number of Angus trim swords, and they all feel special. Like, they're all mm -hmm. good. Even the ones from, like, the... I can't remember if it was, like, tried and true armory or some... Something that probably isn't a very pleasant memory for Angus Trim, but they have, um, like anything he's touched, really has a, a dynamic characteristic to it that is appreciable and uh, and and very very fun. And those those big, yeah, his uh, I can't remember the 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 type he had, but it, it all feels big and magic. And he has a way of taking a big sword, which by contrast, like I know you've talked about the Baron recently, like I. I don't remember having very positive feelings about the Baron. And I think the the Atrium is like not the same, but in in maybe scratches a similar itch. Uh and it it feels great. <laughs> Other than the pommel that wants to to bite me. I think that was something I complained about. I remember talking uh to Angry or texting with him back and forth. Over over Facebook, I think, and I was like Will Pommels, and he had some some thoughts on Will Pommels, which, as I recall, I don't you know I'm paraphrasing here was basically like don't don't grab it then, and I was like, but I like but I like to. I, yeah, I have like complete opposite, complete opposite diff, uh, experience. Like I, I review all of his swords. I said this cross car has some you know you know sharp sharp corners, and you shout to me and that said uh, he he'll improve. He'll, he'll get rid of those sharp corners. Mm -hmm. And I bought a few few more swords from it. Gone. Shop corners are gone. Yeah. So that's some seems to be. A little, it wasn't you know, wasn't tragic. mean spirited or anything like that. But he he has uh, Angus has always been very generous with his time, and so I don't mean anything that I'm saying to to disparage him or make him seem like he didn't care about customer service. But right. one of my thoughts was, admittedly, as a non HEMA practitioner, non expert in the space, was like, hey, I like to grab the pommel. And this one's a little little pokey, um, and I, he provided information which was educational. That like, hey, you you know, that's not mm -hmm. the way that you would necessarily grab it. Some people do, but that's you know, that's not what I'm going for. Um, and again, I'm paraphrasing. He was gentle. He wasn't like, hey, moron, eat a dick and die. Hey, dumb you know? dumb. <laughs> yeah, that that was not that was not the vibe. He was very generous with his knowledge no, and time, no. but uh, it it. It still was a magic sword. Like it, it felt great. I've I've kind of 
um, in the back of my mind, been lusting for one that he puts like three fullers that still have scale uh, mm. in them. And so I, yeah. I like those. I, I like his big fat cutters, but I, I kind of secretly want one that has those like three fullers with the scale yeah. in it. And that that to me, like just has a very like Angus trim vibe, but also like the epitome of his his right. look. I like that that scaly fuller look um, so that he cool. has out there. I'm very fortunate in that I live about an hour away from Angus Trim. And uh, for those of you that have checked out our channel before, John and I have made the trip down to his shop several times. And he is, like Matt said, so generous with his time and just wants to hang out and talk about swords. And it's like easy to kill an hour and a half, two hours down there because he just keeps bringing out swords constantly. It's like like we've handled you love this one and this one and, and this, this one. one. This one I was like, okay, I'm just going to start signing over my paychecks to you, bro. Because like now I'd want all of them. But you're right. I can't remember which 12A it was, but one of the first ones he gave me was what what I thought was going to be a big, imposing war sword. And then I handled it. And I was like, holy shit, this feels like a one handed sword. Like how lively it was was amazing. And he at the time, the lion was the new model that had been announced. It was coming out and he had the prototype and let us handle that, which was amazing. I had the Milan on order at the time and he let me handle the sword that that was based on. I think it's the 14.6 or 7. I can't completely remember. Um, I'm probably totally wrong there, but just stuff like that and just getting to see he's so generous with his time and just wants to show swords and just talk about swords with sword nerds. It was such a fun experience that every time we've gone and uh, before he's done making swords, uh, at the very least, I'm going to get a 12A, not sure which one, probably the dot .19 and a two-handed falchion if he makes another one. I really want one of his two-handed falchions. So, yeah. I, I I'm happy the vision line is going to continue. Perfect, his, uh, his, his designs in partnership with Valiant are are such a treat because like mm -hmm. like the albions they don't come with a scabbard it's nice to have like a high-end manufacturer that isn't yeah. a a project that gives you homework to do i'm used to that in the japanese side of things but you know uh it, it's nice that you can go to one shop and have this very uniform beautiful looking thing without like hey i got my new sword let me mail it to somebody else for a long time yeah, yeah. and it's also that the uh, well, you know he's talking Type twelve A, yeah. It's, you mentioned the Baron, right? Like, it's basically it's, it's the Baron represents the Type twelve A that is not a long sword. That's a, like a hand of hand sword, like the great sword of war. I have not mm -hmm. compare it with even the Principe. Principe weighs almost four pounds, and Baron is just the same. But even you compare it to with the Principe, the Principe is much much nimbler than the Baron. Baron is like you're going all in, right, and committed cleaves. But I think it's trims, 12A, they feel like long swords. They're, they're, mm -hmm. they're light and fast, nimble. I remember uh, Matt reviewed his Type 12A next to, when, when you review, you did a side-by-side -side comparison with the uh, DSA, the Dark Sword Baron, right? The the, the one with, with multiple fullers and how they perform. It was just mind blowing, and also just how how effortless, right? Right. It's not just that they cut well, right? It, it doesn't doesn't do with just cutting well. It handles magically. Yeah, yeah. they're mm -hmm. they're magic. Like it, it's one of those things too, where even if you're not a fan of the way they look, right? Um, yeah. Like I'm, it's not that I don't like European swords, right? I, I, I certainly do. Uh, otherwise, it would be very strange the amount of money I have invested in them. Um, but I, like, admittedly, I like I don't. I they're they're uh, just purely fun to me. Like I don't I don't practice with them. There's any time I take it out it is just purely for my entertainment. Uh, and atrium swords will will do that. Like even if it's you know you're just looking for a, fu a fun sword, like you pick it up. And it's it's fun in the dark, right? Like you, it just feels magic in the hand and makes you smile. And there's there's not like that's that happens to you know when you're a sword enthusiast that happens, <laughs> but it, it's a special kind of thing when like you really feel something that even though it's unfamiliar, you don't practice with it, like you feel like it's an extension of you, and they, it 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 feels uh, connected in a way that you know you appreciate by holding other swords that don't feel that way where you're like this is an object i need to learn to use and angus trim swords are like i think i could trim my toenails with this like i could <laughs> i could reach down and use this to pick things up like i don't i don't feel scared of it i feel like it's right. uh ju just an extension of my arm 
I've never but felt that more Angus often than with Angus Trim Swords for sure. Well, Kane, you you get to pick one now. Uh, Vic, you, you got Valiant. Kyle, uh, Kyle talked about sword here. What, but before we go, um, and since each one of these take twenty minutes to get through, <laughs> yeah, it's not like we're all chatty or anything. Yeah, none of us like to talk uh, about just, I mean, we yeah. the list. Uh, so where are we are now. Gosh, we we've had no real roadmap here, but I, I think we've talked. Uh, we've we've mm -hmm. talked about Sterling. We've talked about Dark Sword for Ronin. I think we've, oh, we we've brought probably, him in the like, conversation and armor, armor a few times. Balor Arms. You you probably mark. I think you mark the uh, Hongshu right. Like I, I often get question about Hongshu, okay. and we all pretty much did do we all own a country yep like you matt reviewed one i reviewed several i don't know i reviewed but i received several and kyle there was and and, and our ratings are wildly different kyle is at b i'm as i'm a, yeah i'm mean, like somewhere in the middle at c and um matt is at d right so at, i would give them a c but look, you guys can go. So this, this is a wild ride, right? Because they are not, they're not, a, it's, a, it's a brand that's by different makers. And we touched upon this a little bit earlier, right? Like, how about <laughs> Kyle, share your experience. Start with so, the positive one. Yeah, this is the Italian longsword, the relatively new model for, for them that we discussed earlier somewhat. And my ranking is this is the only sword from Honshu that I have any experience with. And it's a very good budget option. At least this one specific one is a very good budget option. So again, my ranking was based purely on my experience. That's where I, where I put this in A tier. But there's definitely caveats there that they have a lot of stuff that I would not touch with a 10-foot pole. Yeah. So but if you can get this some of their newer honchu historic look has a similar look to this the, the stuff that looks like Balor arms because it basically is Balor arms at least the original those are generally pretty decent budget swords mm -hmm. so um for those of you watching um that sword the honchu historic forge italian long sword that is going to be the next review coming out on our channel on She Sword Reviews. And then after that, we're going to have the comparison video <laughs> with uh, that and the Balor Arm Sword. And I agree with Kyle there. Like, if you could guarantee you were getting a good version of it, that sword is more than worth the $260. I see why the, you said that the previous Balor Armors version was your favorite budget sword. Like, I could see that. However, spoilers to our review, ours had some quality control issues that were not really, really good. Um, Things that, you know, we'll talk about more in the review, but not the least of which being like a crack in the peen block and the blade looking like it had a piece of it just shaved out and then continuing to go straight. Um, so little things like that. I mean, that's another point of contention or a topic to discuss is like for $260, is that a fair roll of the dice to expect those kind of issues? Or should you expect the sword to be as advertised with no issues whatsoever? So that was the thing we talked about. But I will say the grip wrap on that is really, really good. The scabbard is really, really good. And for $260, getting a hollow grind blade, that's not a thing you get very often. And like it felt really good. But as Kane, you said in your way back review of the original Balor Arms Italian Longsword, the percussion nodes are totally off. You bang the pommel and it vibrates in all the wrong paces or places. Non-sword people, non-enthusiasts, aren't going to care. They're going to just get it, start swinging and have a good time. But people like us, we're going to notice and we're going to care. So it, I guess, again, it depends on what you're willing to sacrifice for that price. But if you got a good one, I think that's a good sword. But yeah. You have to yeah, be Conan Atlantean was... in order to tolerate those kind of bad blade nodes. You have to be like the yeah. dumbest, coolest sword ever. And your to... hands doing this. <laughs> like when you hit yeah. a water bottle, yeah, it's pretty bad. You're just like, ah, I got it, I got it, I got it. <laughs> it goes back to the maker of those, which is OTC or Eric Steelcrafts. They are not consistent. They can make some excellent swords. And I've had 
generally speaking, very good luck with the swords I've got from them. Uh, but I've seen like Kane's Valor Arms Italian long sword that was a wet noodle. It could it was flexed like 90 degrees, if I remember right. Yeah. Um, and you just never know what you're going to get with them. So it's just it's a crapshoot. And I, I had to I had to do it based on my, my my ranking of an A tier was based on the one sort of I had experience with kind of a limitation of my ranking system, but it's what I decided on. Fair. And like, my other, go ahead. Oh, you go ahead. No, just my only other experience was I do have the gen one single edged Viking sword from Bella Arms, which is the OTC. And that's where it's perfect. Literally nothing wrong with that. Feels good. Moves good. Like feels, I, I will agree with Matt that just the Viking swords with that kind of pommel really like digging your hand if you don't hold them the correct way, which you is have to be careful to, get, to hold them right. Yeah, it's weird to get used to, but aside from that, like it's a really, really good sword. And if they all came with that level of quality, that would be the one of the best budget brands out there. But it, it's a crapshoot, apparently. Like you said, you're rolling the dice. So sorry, Matt. Go ahead. No, the, you know the I gave them the worst rating, and the it was a D. Mm-hmm. And what what kept them out of the F tier is like it was a hundred dollars. And it did last for a while. And they did say, hey, you know, this part of the thing that, you know, of your feedback, this part of it we find valid. And it was the pommel, this this little shoe guy here. They were like, yeah, that's not good. We're, we're working on that. Um, and so I thought for $100, like it was a neat looking thing. And it, it did, it was usable. And you, you could do stuff to a point. And one of the major concerns that I had was going to be addressed. Um, so, you know, you, I, I would generally think that that's, that's a reasonable value, but what, what changes it, uh, is that the, the blade broke in a spot where I, I was abusing it admittedly, but, um, this is where it gets into like, inter, you know, what's acceptable and what's not. So it's taking the blade and I was slapping the flat of it on a tree and, you know, like you can see in the video, right? It's, there's, there's no smoke and mirrors here. Like you can see that I'm. I'm not a, a small man and I was not swinging like, you know, really leaning into it and the blade uh, broke in half and, you know, a part of it kind of flung away. And I said, I don't think that that's OK. Like I, I would have accepted bending, um, twisting, you know, uh, some rattle in the hilt furniture. All of that is in within realm for banging it on a tree and using a sword poorly like a, a dumb axe or like a hammer. But breaking in half is not, not, that's not okay. And they were like, no, you use the sword like an ax. That's not what it's for. Breaking would be okay. You know, presumably I'm, I'm assuming that that's what they, they're inferring is that the blade could, could break. And that's like, that's not what it's for. And you should know better. But at the same time, like where, where I would praise Ronan Katana for saying their ad copy says, go have fun in the backyard. Right. And I beat the shit out of them and they hold up to that backyard abuse in, in a way that I've found over the course of, you know, a dozen examples to be consistent. The uh, the Honshu line, the one that I, I did test, uh, fell apart quickly. They were pretty quick to say you're using it wrong. Well, simultaneously having ad copy of people doing that shit. Like, it's the most durable. Like, yeah, it'll bring your fuckery to the new level. Like, it's got that kind of <laughs> herbalistic, you know, like, it's super cool and super durable. Go be a ninja. Kind of like, that's, that's the vibe I get, even if it's not, like, specifically in in text but they're they're kind of saying like it's a durable awesome thing and then like i slap it at a tree and it breaks in half and that's not for a you know a mediocrely heat treated sword or something that's too brittle that's not unexpected and i i did do things you know up to that that were also in the in the realm of debatably or at least poorly contrived activities to do with a sword so it's not like it's it's a dainty thing but before that the the this thing fell off. The scabbard was not great. It wasn't particularly sharp. It, it needed work out of the box to do sword-like things, uh, even the sword-like things that I would say they they advertised it as. And so it kind of felt like, yeah, you you know, if you don't mind putting a little money into it and they fix the pommel issue, like you, you, you get something that's, you know, okay. And it is still only a hundred bucks, but uh, the the bamboo stick from uh, Fidestazan and like a Wakazashi from Fidestazan are a hundred bucks. Uh, uh, Jayco offers swords for a hundred bucks. Um, 
you can buy a Ronin scratch and dent for you know more than a hundred bucks, but not not overwhelmingly far off of that. Uh, and all of those are going to hold up better to mm -hmm. that. And they are not specifically none of them are specifically sold as you know beat this you know this kind of like I should be able to take the doomsday kind of kind of nonsense. Uh, so I, I thought that was really uh, a bummer, a bummer. And I thought the response of like, that's not what you're supposed to do with a sword was also like, yeah, I, I would, if they had said something along the lines of like, oh, our, yeah, bending or twisting would have been more acceptable in that. And we're going to, we're going to look at it. I would have, I would have had a little bit more confidence, but as it is, it seems like a sword that uh, if you wanted to use it for s the, the end of days kind of backyard brush being a tactical ninja the assumption is that i guess from the vendor is you're always going to be cutting the meaty bits of people and that they will stand there and wait for you to do that also that you possess some level of sharpening skill yourself because there's certainly would would struggle to to chop into a person um but people move and like try to hit you back and if you need to use your sword defensively slapping it at a tree is not great but also like i'm kind of you know limp dick in this fucking sword in the tree like i'm not hitting it really that hard mm -hmm. and i would say that if somebody swung a bat at your head and you wanted to smack it out of the way or like deflect it in some way the impact would be substantially harder than the way i was hitting that tree and that's a reasonable thing to assume for like these end of day small ninja kind of swords that somebody might swing something back at you and you might not want to get hit with it and deflect it with the sword so breaking in half is not an okay thing and saying it's not you're dumb for doing that like well I concede that point, but also like the sword should not have have broken there, uh, and like also the pommel fell off, you know, like and it was meh. So that was a straight up D level experience. <laughs> and I think they did not like my uh, my take on that, and and I have not heard from Bud K <laughs> Bud K since. Uh, yeah, yeah, I which is unfortunate because I think if I tested other things. That I think I would probably have an anomaly because I know Shad uh, has the, like the the overweight kind of arming ish sword, but he beats the shit out of things with it, and it's it's lasted. And I think he had to like put something to do with the pommel back on, but he's had a lot of fun with it, and like it's been very durable for some of the the debatably wise things uh, he does with the sword. And other people have said they haven't had the same experience, so I I bet that. You know, I, I might have just gotten a dud, but um, that was the experience I had. And I, I didn't I didn't think like the it's not an axe was the wisest yeah. response. Any, any company can have a dud. The the real key is how they react to it. Yeah. Agreed. Now, in fairness, I, I did also put out like a drunken review and I, I don't think, the, you know, I hadn't done one of those in a minute. Um, and I don't Do think more. That, yeah, uh, it's. Uh, I think people enjoyed it and I don't, this is the other thing about reviews and I don't know if you found it to be the case, but that like what I say doesn't really matter, right? If I say something is bad, that doesn't mean people won't buy it. Um, I know this because in my own dojo, there is a guy that I study with who knows I'm a fanatic about swords, watched my YouTube video about a katana that I didn't like and said so, and then bought it anyway. It's like, yeah, I know you didn't like it, but I bought it. And I'm like, okay, okay. Like, you know me personally. I guess that's more of a detriment. <laughs> in person, like, you know I'm, you know I'm dumb and you should listen to me. I think he's telling like, you what he thinks of your opinion, Matt. Yeah, <laughs> I think so. I think oftentimes that's people just watch a review and they want you to agree with them is part of the problem. That's what Sorfan Holger calls an ask hope. An asshole is someone who asks for your opinion and then disregard it. I like probably just to troll you. And sometimes mm. no, no, this dojo mate did not ask me my opinion, but he did say like, "Hey, I watched the video you made, and you know, I, I, I showed the sword in such a way that it was made him think it was worth his money, and mm. I, I wasn't complimentary <laughs> to it, but I was honest and I showed the things, and and dojo friend bought it." and you know has has been largely happy with it so cool like it just goes yeah. to show that just because i say something isn't good like even if you know me personally you it's not going to do anything <laughs> if you if you want the honshu 
sub hilt wakazashi i can't imagine anything that i said uh avoided sales but hopefully somebody would not try to use it as an axe and be surprised by the result so i um yeah i'm i'm bummed out that that uh that didn't work out because i would enjoy to, testing some other stuff that's there because i think it's it's affordable and fun uh, and it's just a bummer that the experience ahead was crappy and I guess, you know, soured the whole, <laughs> the whole conversation with them. That's gonna, that's, uh, that's me with a uh, shadow dancer. Yeah. Yeah. I will never get a review sample from them again. Would, would you take one? Yes. If they, you'd, re you'd review one and be, be fair about it. Yeah. No. Were they the ones that gave you the really bad feedback and said something along the lines where you're not qualified to test that? Yes. Okay. But you know what? It's their loss. Really. That's, that's it's the a shame way because they, do it. I know Matt has a lot of great things to say about that. And we're going completely off of Euro Swords here. But Matt has a lot of great things to say about them. And my experience was not good. But the experience with their customers are not. I wouldn't say customer service because I wasn't a customer. They sent me a review sample. But my experience with their representative was not good at all. Yeah, the, there there was a, a, a bit of a kerfuffle. I, I recall Jardian got a sword. A fellow YouTube reviewer did, did it. And like I think it was the first review sample that, that he got. And for the folks here, like we've all gone through, like, hey, somebody sent us a sword. Like, it's a... a it's it's really cool. Uh, it's really cool every time. It does not lose the coolness when it happens. It's always awesome. But the first time it happens, like there's a certain acknowledgement that comes with, like, oh, I I must be worth, like my opinion must be worth something. There's there's a validation that comes comes with that. So then have the the company that sends it to you like turn around and be like, hey, we shouldn't have done that. You're dumb. Like that's. <laughs> uh, like it doesn't, it you know, it only makes the reviewer like feel bad, but it certainly doesn't. At least to I think a U.S. audience doesn't make, doesn't paint the manufacturer in a in a good light. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, uh, <laughs> I agree. So, it's, it is unfortunate, though, Kyle, because I do most like if I look at the product, I mostly have positive things to say. I think Kane, you you yeah. have a katana from them too, and and have been complimentary based on the price. Yeah, the the shadow dancer, right? It's it's um, basically sold for nothing, and uh, it's very well put together. But there's no there's no attempt at reaching out. Like they didn't. I, I bought someone from them, and they didn't even have a, like a confirmation email or anything. And then one day, something just got shipped from Malaysia. It's like what the hell even is that? And they didn't even use their own their their own label or anything. Thing. I don't even know what I was supposed to to get, and but it was a it was a <laughs> good, good sort, well worth the the asking price, uh, the low low price. Yeah. But about the um the which you mentioned about you know the Hung Shu's response to you, um, I I experienced something like about the sword, something similar. Right, <laughs> we can have a talks over this, but um, yeah, their, their response is somewhat different, and it's, so this is like the this... sword best friend's necklace, like it's <laughs> <laughs> like what that became, right? You gotta start trying, yeah, and of right. So <laughs> this, this, I, I read them as C, and for a reason, I was basically between the two of you and and the uh, side, the Darso Armory. I rated between the two of you as well, right? Like it's it's not because I want to take a middle ground or you or I don't have my own opinion. I just I have I have a lot of opinion about them, and it's just especially about Hangzhou. It's not one. It's one company, one seller, but it's not one maker. Many makers, and so I experienced everything you, you <laughs> from from each of you uh, here. Like first. I got a bunch of Japanese source sent by Buck K for me to test. So I was very appreciative. And they were going to send more to me and send their Pangshu Boshin line. And the, you look at the name, you know it's a more ninja brand, right? Like they want to take traditional sword. Boshin means reform in Japanese, and they want to make it modern. And the result was, you know, it's not flattering. And basically, every aspect of that sword is problematic, and it would 
then it wouldn't ha handle like a crowbar, worse than a crowbar, actually. And there's no understanding of how the sword should be made, and it doesn't cut anything. Basically, it's just a baseball bat. And and this fell off, just like... And I've seen this fall, falling off on, on mine and yours, and some other I show at some other YouTuber uh, it, it, in the exact same way right and so the thread broke on the inside it wasn't supposed it wasn't secure with a thread it was supposed to be secured with a bunch of epoxy and eventually or glue it's always glued on eventually that glue just failed right because you cut anything with it it wouldn't cut so eventually it's just gonna have these cracks inside it broke off and this is not acceptable, right? Supposedly a pummel is there to serve a function, to keep the hilt tight, right? To, to it's a final assembly of the hilt. And there are lots of people, other other than you know people putting on their this experience on YouTube. There are other bringing this up, and and they reach out to to Hongshu or to Bucket, and they said, "Oh, not enough people had that experience, so it's not a problem to us." And and I I I told them that. Um, Basically, everything I have about that sort is is very negative, and they say, okay, so so don't publish a review and have a, like an internal review. You, you basically tell us everything that's wrong with that sort, and they, they they don't appear to be hostile or they have any animosity against me. And I told everything I saw about, about that sort and how to improve it. And you they didn't send you, me a came, sword. I'm sorry to interrupt, Ken. Do you do you do you take issue like I? I I see it as like a mm. a conflict of interest if somebody sends me something to do a public review, right? The reason I get stuff is because forty thousand people for some reason find a vague interest in what I have to say, and that's that's why I get stuff, right? And yeah. so the company sends this to me as a marketing material in an attempt to reach that audience. That's the the thing that they get out of this arrangement, and hopefully some feedback, and hopefully they like care about the the stuff I have to say, and and you know, it's it's cheap R and D for them, um, yeah. but primarily it's marketing to to reach that audience. And so, if they send it to me and it's bad, I'll try to tell folks like, "Hey, this isn't good. This happened," which I believe I did for the folks at Bud K. Um, before I publish it, just so that like, hey, if somebody calls up and says, "I have a similar concern," what are you going to do for me? They're not like blindsided and they're aware and. Have a, have a chance to like figure out what they're going to do for customers, if anything, or at least draft a response. Or maybe it's that guy's an idiot and doesn't know what he's talking about. But either way, they're they're you know prepared to handle uh, any kind of confused customers, or at least have the opportunity to be prepared. But if they tell me like, "Hey, don't publish that review," I'm like, every time it's happened a few times, and it soured a few relationships when I get asked to not do it, and then I do it anyway. Because like that, that's why you sent it to me. There's no backsies. This is a, a product available for somebody to purchase today that you sent mm -hmm. to try and get, you know, garner favor with the audience that follows me. And now because it's shitty, you want to be like, hey, how about a mulligan? And there are mm -hmm. there are some chances where, you know, I'll say, like, you can send another one and I'll I'll include both. But like if it's an anomaly, then it'll show up as an anomaly because the next one won't have the problem. Um but yeah, like, do you, do you take any issue with let me do it internally after they sent it to you trying to, you know, you've got, you've got more than a thousand people relying on your opinion and they're like, yeah, just, just keep it, keep it between us. Yeah, it, it, it seems I can understand why they do that because I told them that if I publish a review and they will, it would seem to the audience that I would just bash in a sword because there's no redeeming quality about this sword. Not there's nothing positive <laughs> about it, right? It's it's wrong in every each single like, yeah. Like I I don't because I don't want to attract that kind of negativity to my channel. I, at the time, it wasn't very big at the time, and it's admittedly still not big, but much smaller at the time. So I was I don't I don't want to spend the time you know to make a review, spend as much time as I need to make a review, and then. Like it can be negative, right? but if every single aspect is negative, like I don't, I just don't see a point of, and I, I can see why somebody don't want to, somebody 
you 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 have a budget to send to someone, and they they have only bad things to say about you. That's that's kind of weird. So I I can understand that. So I didn't need to spend the time I needed to make a review, but then I I, I write everything down、um, to explain, right? So they they can have a chance. To because that's not a one off. That's like an outlier. So they they send a new one, and it's gonna be. It's it, this is not a lemon, right? It's it's designed to be wrong <laughs> in every each way. So、uh, of course it will be cool if they say you know go ahead publish you know go at it as you know everything you you have is isn't、um, it more valuable like, though? Like if everything is negative and there's no redeeming quality. Even if you make a short video that says like I got this and there's nothing good to say about it, but I I think then like all I I I didn't see a recall like I didn't see any <laughs> I,、yeah. as far as I could tell after I said the pommel falls off and it breaks apart it was still for sale the next day. Yeah,、um, yeah. And I, I, I see I that's I think that's definitely a problem that they don't they are unwilling to correct the mistake right. If I I send a I send all the feedback and they're like okay. So we're gonna put this right, discontinue that, and we're gonna make it better. Then that's cool, right? But they didn't do anything as a follow up. I mean, I suppose they did something. Maybe eventually they decided that this this line is no good. But they two years later they sent you another sort of this bullshit line, right? And it's it's the same still the same garbage. So I mean, I, I'm sorry, but this is a nice gentleman, but you know the. Story you design, not you. The the guy's in house design is is garbage. It's no no good, right? And well, I, the, I think the they must have tried. Th- this one is at least threaded. It was still just glued and fell off, but there are threads there that had the intent of there, being. There's threads on this one. It's just not. It's、oh. not used. <laughs> yeah, it's not used. So like that's not cool, right? It's it's way more problematic than saying, oh, if it's. The, the review is entirely negative. Don't publish it. Just, but but tell us what to do. I'm I'm right? curious, Kyle. Is that、uh, how would you, you handle that? You for me. So,、uh, anytime a company reaches out or I reach out to a company to talk about review samples, I always lead with I'm going to provide you my detailed feedback, and it's going to be 100% honest. Anything that you want to respond to. Get me a response in time for the review, and I will include your side of the story, basically. But I am going to do a completely honest review, and I I haven't had anybody ask me to not review, not release a review yet. I would hope not to see that, but I I don't I understand that there it's it's a marketing tactic for most of them. I think there's some. That are actually using it for feedback. I think Romance of Men, for instance, is using it as feedback. But there's most of them are doing it as marketing, like you said. And there, the bargain I see it as is: they send me a sword, I release a video. I make no promises whatsoever that it's going to be a positive video. And if, if if asked, would you see some some issue in in not like? I think it's admirable to say, like, "Hey, this didn't go well. We're gonna go back to the drawing board."、Um, Romance of Men actually is one that I have done that with to an extent, where they've sent swords, and I've said, "This is the same thing," and they've said, "Hey, can we can we send you something? Can we try again?" Like, that's not disregard.、And、I've said, "All right," but like, it's still gonna go in the video. But like, you can you can do the you can send another thing, and I can we can like I can show that you've you've got improvement. I think, but would you、um, just not do it and call it like internal review? I think, for in terms of internal review, I there's actually somebody who reached out to me recently who wanted to send me a couple swords just for private feedback, and no problem with that at all. But in terms of if you're sending yeah, it after for, after the fact, what's that? Because I can understand like you you get something okay, no, and、yeah. they just want private feedback. Then you're you're fine giving it, but if if the idea was that you're gonna make a public review about it, and then you reached out and said, "Hey, it's not good. Heads up," and they were like, "Yeah, how about you know?" If, if they wanted to、that? respond in more than just "Here's our response to your to your criticisms 
um, by like sending me a diff another sword or another example. I think part of it would depend on the relationship I have with the company. Like if Romance of Men did it, they've sent me several already. I know that they are being honest about wanting feedback. I think that I would definitely be amenable to that. But I don't know. I, I'm not sure how I would respond to that. That's something I'm going to have to think about. Yeah, well, it's it's one of those, uh, you know, getting your first review sample is uh, is a fun one. Being asked to bury it is a less fun one. What about, Vic, what about you? Um, well, fortunately, unfortunately, uh, we're still the baby channel here, and uh, we've only ever gotten a review sample from Romance of Men, a couple of them. Thanks again for that, Kyle. Um, and, you know, we did like the swords. We were positive about them. But that did spark the conversation uh, between John and I as to what would we do if we did get bad ones. And so the thing that we kind of landed on was kind of similar to Kyle or and like you, Matt, is just like, okay, so if we get a sample, a review sample, and it's not good and there's a bunch of things wrong with it, we're going to reach out to them and let them know, hey, these are the things that we think are, are wrong with it. Like, do you have anything to say about it? And, and or do you want to send us another one? And if they do or if they have a response, cool, that's going to be included. But we're going to say what we thought about the original one. And if they asked us not to say or not to publish or not to you know, say what we thought about the bad one, I would feel really uncomfortable doing that because I feel like above and beyond anything else, what we're doing here, the whole reason we're doing this channel is to try to show people what they can expect from whatever company or what they could expect from buying this sword. So if we're like, oh, no, we got a bad one. Wait, don't put it out. That feels like we're being disingenuous to an audience and granted not a very large audience but an audience that still does somewhat trust us in terms of like what we're going to say about a sword so i feel like we have an obligation to be honest about what we got and if they gave us a better sample we'll show that if they gave us feedback we'll show that too but i would never not publish a video because the maker was like hey we didn't like that even if that burnt that bridge, well, then that kind of sucks. But what if you and, really like the maker, though? Purely hypothetical. It, it's not happening. Purely hypothetical. Like, then again, we would reach out and be like, "Hey, these are the issues. What do you have to say about that?" And but to me, this is a matter of like now. It's, it's kind of ethical now. Like it's kind of are we going to get special treatment and get sent a better one, or have excuses made that people who aren't have a, a platform as small as it is going to get? And if we're getting preferential treatment. That's not okay because if I'm a buyer, that's going to spend my hard-earned money in a bad economy. Like that, I have an obligation to the people that hit that subscribe button and give me their time to like watch what I have to say on the internet about swords, right? So, like to me, I have an obligation to my audience to be honest and transparent. And I would hope the maker would do that too. And if the maker chooses not to do that, I'm going to do it in a polite, respectful way as possible. But I'm going to be like, this is what happened, right? And, you know, we haven't gotten a whole lot of review samples. Like I said, just the ones from Realm of Men. They actually just reached out. They're going to send us another katana. That's super cool. We've reached out to one other maker and asked them if they want to send us review samples. They told us no. And I transported back to high school. and was like, oh, rejection. Hello, darkness, my old friend. That's cool. <laughs> ah, that's a very familiar feeling. Um, nom, nom. 99 um, slaps, my guy. It's, you know. It's, it's part of the process. game. It's, it's it's part of what's going on. You're going to get told no a lot more than you're going to get told yes. Um, I, I, I'll tell you, I get told no. I, yeah. I, I, a lot, I get told no a lot more than I get told yes, but you know, I, I get ignored more than anything else. <laughs> that's left you on red. That's rough. Yeah. And Vic, you said it better than I did. I, I, I pretty, I wholeheartedly agree with what Vic said there about having an obligation to the audience, to the people who have subscribed. I, I'm not going to be bought by a company. So if I did have situation where they wanted me not to review a sample they sent, the most I would, I think I would do would be agree to have them send me another one, but that doesn't mean I'm going to bury what happened to the first right. one. It's no matter what that, because who's to say the, the second one is more representative right. of what other people would buy than the, the first one. The first one very well could be very representative of what the average person wants to buy and for for me that you people deserve to know what i receive mm -hmm. yeah and it, it, you see is with me is more comp complicated as, as the story progresses it's not that i have a problem telling people it's bad right it yeah. just i have a problem like like 
devoting all of my tired time that I need to publish a right. review. <laughs> so and that I don't want to talk about it. Because this one is such an outlier. It's not that I can find redeeming quality, right? Like, there's no redeeming. Like, it's straight up, I don't think it deserves tier B, D. It's probably tier F, right? But it's not like, it's catastrophic in some way. Not like it broke in half. It didn't break in half. I, I chopped down a tree with it, and it was still intact, minus sense the pummel, right? So there's, I guess you can say there's some redeeming quality in that, but I don't see the, the value in that. But in any way, I was hoping that if I give them the feedback, and they are going to improve upon that, they are going to discontinue that, or they're going to revamp the entire i told them to go back to the drawing board mm -hmm. but apparently they did but here's the thing they still reach out to me later for some other advices on other examples that mm -hmm. the one that chat received and the later so they they what they did is that it's not that they re, like uh just uh discontinue all of their existing examples because i look at all of them right the bullshit the Boshin Brawsword, the Boshin Katana, they're, 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 not, they're not designed to be functional. And then they reach out to Witless. So presumably this is a more reputable maker. So they could ask for something from them that they, they haven't been able to do. So they, they reach out to me again for some advice for that, you know, the single-handed Brawsword. And they didn't go well the first time around, but they improved that. And, and then the the Claymore, they didn't send me anyone, any one of those for like two years, but they sent me one this year, and that that Hongshu Scottish two-handed sword. And it was pretty good. I didn't, because it was made by Windless. I, I just, I don't have the utmost confidence in Windless usual offering, right? But this one's pretty good. I, they're, they're recent um, offerings, right? whether it's contract or their in-house brands are definitely better. And that one, they just, it handles much better. It cuts better. It, it, it's like a real sword. So I gave it pretty high praise. And, you know, for, for the price they charge for a really long, you know, 45 inch blade, two handed sword, it's, it's great. And even though they didn't, I, I give them like a, the, the specification of the uh, distal taper, the profile, the weight and, balance desirable because they they obviously needed my advice and they didn't like implement that to a t but pretty close so i was pleasantly surprised right so you can see this ocean uh Hongshu line is not not one brand it's not one maker mm -hmm. and then now they have the um the otc right iteration basically like a whole bunch of um um source models inspired by Albion, right? Like it, it is pretty obvious that they have one inspired by Sovereign and the uh, original Italian longsword and one that's um, based on the Albion prints, right? So they're, they're, they seem to be pretty good. Right? And they, they put a lot of thought into that. So if I take everything into consideration, this brand as a whole, I, I think it deserves a C, right? Mm -hmm. But if we just take like one one example, there's there, there's no doubt. Like I, I said it a few times, like last time on, on Matt, Matt's live stream, so that there, there's no, <laughs> he had to stop me. <laughs> there's no redeeming quality about that. So. <laughs> yeah. There, there's well, nothing here, here, with, with the end of Billy Madison. Yeah, to more uh, curious about the Hangzhou brand. Yeah, don't go with well, the I, ocean line, right? I, I think the more interesting topic, at least at least for me, because I, I I find it it sounds like at least that experience around the Hangzhou is is clear, and that you're you're looking at some of the other, uh, you know, the other experiences that you've had outside of just the one bad one. And I've unfortunately only had the one bad one. But the the interesting part to me is that. Uh, you would not re not review it because there was nothing good to say and not that those are like fun to make and it, it certainly gives a bad vibe but like you're it's not um 
it's not that you can't do like a more concise version of like here i feel i took the time to film myself the pommel fell off like there's those quick highlights and if you say like hey there's really nothing good here to talk about how many people would have not bought it because mm -hmm. there's not a ton of information out about all of these products right so mm -hmm. how many people would go and be like oh that's cool i wonder if it's any good like not a ton of people are necessarily even going to take the time to do that but the ones that did might stumble upon Kane's video and be like, hey, I want to say nice things, but I just can't fucking think of a single one. Um, right. I'm going to take my best friend pommel bracelet and, you know, uh, use it as an ice <laughs> rock for my whiskey glass or something. Um, yeah. <laughs> that's uh, a brilliant idea. Yeah, that's that's what we can use it for. Pommel um, ice cubes, put them in the freezer. I, and it breaks your glass and you're like, damn it, my whiskey. I think <laughs> uh, cross me I, again. Another thing to consider for all of us, circling back to like if a manufacturer ever hypothetically said, hey, don't put that review out, is that like, yo, we all have full time jobs. None of us are getting paid uh, like I'm not getting paid anything. I know, Matt, you get some money, but it's not enough to live off of anywhere near that much. Right. So like we all have full time jobs. So filming and, and editing and doing all that, that takes a lot of time. That's like the, the editing and all that is so much more than people who don't do this like comprehend like they don't know how much time goes into like making even like a, a 15 minute video right and so like if you're going to put all that time and effort especially for like john and i we live in different places we have very different work schedules so just getting together to coordinate to shoot can be a, a pain in the ass sometimes so like if we're going to put all that work into a video and then if we we're going to be told hey don't do that ethical stuff aside that would also be an issue we'd be like well no we put this many hours into this what if they say i'll pay you for your time like you have like time how much, man. Everybody's valuable. got a price. How much? Just, well, just you got to yeah. hit me with the right number. I'm you joking. want to give no, me I retirement wouldn't. money, then I might consider that. Yeah, all right. It would have to be a big number. Yes. It would have to be a four I, digit for each tribute. Yeah. 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 yeah it would have to be big. I that that is an interesting thing, given that like all of us have have occupations that allow us to buy these luxury items and then are good enough at it that we have time to make video right like we're uh yeah we're yeah there, it's like you can't you, position, definitely you can't uh it's gonna be tough it's gonna yeah. be a tough ass to be like let me pay you for your time be like well ooh, ooh, yeah yeah that's to make the like when it's almost depressing uh i <laughs> I don't want to do the, the math. Matt, don't make me do the math. I don't want to do the numbers. No, no. Like just because it's happened, you know, uh, not, not to say anyone's been like, Hey, let me give you a hundred thousand dollars to not talk bad about our sorts. It's nothing, you know, like you don't have to put a tinfoil hat on, but I, I have been asked not to publish reviews. And I have asked, been asked like, Hey, yeah, your time is valuable. And I, I think it was genuinely meant that way. Not as some like backhanded bribe, but like, yeah, you, you put time into it. Um, but it, it strikes me as this time I was I was volunteering, uh, doing a thing, and somebody was like, "Hey, you know, like, how about we pay you for your time?" And I was like, "You couldn't afford me. Like, it's not. It wouldn't. It would like anything you could offer would probably just be really deeply insulting. Like, I do this for fun, and if you're gonna be like, "Hey, how about we don't do it for a hundred bucks?" I'm gonna be like, "Let me." I need yeah. soap. Like, I feel dirty. And that's the thing. Yeah, <laughs> even if they gave me a lot of money, I would feel dirty. I'd be like, I don't know how good this feels. Like, I mean, yeah, you you can't sell like hundred dollar swords on the internet and then be like, let me let me pay you a million dollars to not talk bad about yeah. our sword. Like, like you could have just made a better sword <laughs> for that much money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that's yeah, kind of you could have hired uh, Peter Johnson to design your sword. Seriously. Also, yeah. why are you yeah, talking about our it would be an interesting experiment if I to publish uh, like a review like that is entirely everything is negative <laughs> and and I didn't I didn't film it because I I just did some cutting and smashing things up to that effect so I just at the time I, I wasn't willing to dedicate that amount of time you know for filming the reviews and close up shots um, but it will be interesting you know to dedicate you know dozens or even up to a hundred hours and then and, and yeah maybe now now that i see it that maybe it will be very positive you know among the community because uh the the tearless videos i did i spent about 
almost 200 hours on it, and there was some negativity in it. And people some. were very supportive, you know, very supportive. So I think some were very supportive. You, you you talked about Angel Sword and then Albie, and you're like, I know many of you would hate that I've even said them in the same sentence. <laughs> My, yeah. So, yeah. Some negativity. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know what I would do about a sword that ha I had nothing good to say. I mean, even the worst sword I review, the worst review I, I gave a sword was the Dark Sword Armory sword, and I had good things to say about it. Not a ton, but there were definitely positives there. Yeah, and it would be it would it would suck to have to record something that is one hundred percent nothing positive possible. That that would not be a fun review to do at all. No, however, I see you, Kyle, and I will raise you. It depends on how mean you want to be. Because uh, if you guys watched our Kraken review from Zombie Tools, John had a great time with that thing. And he, quote, I would rather not go to Valhalla than have to take this with me to battle forever. So, like, he had a great time with that thing. Yeah. So it can be a lot of fun. Yeah, but, but you, you still notice, like, there's... Um... The upside about the durability right? yeah no it is not positive things it is like no good in every each aspect that that would be an interesting experiment and it did look cool yeah. however i've never played with anything that was trying to unalive me every time i swung it so you know that was a big negative so something you, that we completely hated would be weird if it's all negative i the objective anyway i think is probably uniform across because all of us have day jobs right so like we're trying to contribute to the conversation and help people decide if it's worth their money or not and so to that effect if it was all negative then i like i would think that would be important you know like hey yeah. and, and i think your motive is important there kane because if you're like that isn't fun for me to do and this is a hobby of mine that i share because i like doing it and so I, I just that's not that sucks. Like yeah, yeah that's it, important. It, in contrast, it, uh, of, in contrast to like I don't want to piss them off because I want to keep getting free swords. Like I think anytime it, it, also, that, it, it takes a lot to explain that, right? Like if it's negative in each way, then people will go, surely there are some, you know, you know, you spend some some money, you get some steals, right? It's, no, it's not like the, the, it has, the like I mentioned. I even brought it to a recycler, yeah, and they made me pay to take it away. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, the thing I value the most is how they handle, right? Function like swords, and this thing, like it doesn't function like a sword. It, it wouldn't hurt you, right? Like not like the kraken that will, will impale you, right? But but then there's it, it, it takes a lot for me to break it down because especially if you consider. You know the Hangzhou Boshin Lines customer base, right? Like back then, I mean, how much, how many of them would <laughs> see value in you breaking down the dynamic, you know, harmonic, harmonic properties of a sword? Like, I don't, I don't think you have to go that far though. If the pommel falls off, oh yeah, the pommel you know? falls off. As um, in, yeah. But that, that's you know, just food, food for thought. I did think it's interesting that you know. Uh, everyone's got their own little like quirks about how they want to do a review and like what should be included and has, yeah. you know, is it, trying to do the right thing by and large and, you know, has a different way of approaching it. So it's interesting that you would have a, a an overwhelmingly negative. I, I think there's other people that would gravitate towards that. Like, oh yeah, I'm going to dig into this shit. Like this is all negative. <laughs> King, I, got I, I agree. Those, those aren't fun to make. I don't like having negative things to say um it's not it's not a positive time plus you have to review it and like you don't i don't go into it expecting it to be shit and yeah. then if it is like you're like i still have to fucking feel i have to edit it, i have to take it off the card it's like it's, i have to do all the thing and put it in the software and listen to my dumb face talk it myself for an hours on end all to deliver a message that there's no redeeming quality yeah, I think none of us want to hate anything, right? We all want to find something redeeming and some information to share. So, sorry, Kyle, I didn't mean to cut you off there. That's okay, Kane. I have a I have a positive for you for that sword. Give it or send it to somebody you really dislike, and then you can say you make them experience the sword. There's your positive. It's it's a hate sword. <laughs> nice, I like it. <laughs> it, it'd almost be a comical thing like it's bad at everything observe boat anchors paperweights it like <laughs> all make your a whole series of shorts about it yeah that 
that's uh, all the things you can't do with the Boshin line. Um, yeah, I, w we were talking about worst swords. I, I think the worst one that I re reviewed, uh, which which uh, another sword friend out there gives me grief about, and is like, you, it's the only one you've ever been mean to, Matt. Was the a sword from Al Ayubi in the it was like a Indonesian made cable Damascus mm. sword, uh, and oh. and yeah, yeah, that one was all bad. It had the poke you. Uh, it had the fall apart. It had the exploding handle. It had it had it had the higher than it should be price for something made to made to kill you, uh, you know, made to to unalive the wrong part, <laughs> the, the wrong party in the engagement. Yeah, yeah, that was that was the worst one I I ever reviewed. It wasn't fun to make, and I didn't like doing it. Yeah, that that sword is definitely worse than. <laughs> that bullshit was not that that level of uh, you know the ten full of hosts. Yeah. Well, that's that's your positive spin. It is uh, as bad as that sword is. It is not the sword from all AUB. That's <laughs> admittedly. <laughs> yeah, I, I did. I did chop a tree down with it, and it didn't like further breaking down. So to to switch to a more positive note. Have there been uh, have there been swords that you expected to be meh, and then we're just like, "Wow, this is absolutely amazing!" I know we we talked about one quite a bit already, but apart from the ones that you may have mentioned, are there any fun stories? Because I said we have to end soon and then talk for another like hour. An hour ago. Yeah. I guess uh, Hongshu, the his sword, his they call it historic forge, and I think it's historic, right? Like they want to be historical swords. And the Claymore, the Scottish Shuhan sword, I uh, genuinely surprised me because it was made by Witless. I didn't, I didn't have any hope, and not just high hope. I didn't have any hope for for stuff they make, and it it, it was genuinely fun, and it was it was light for for a sword that's you know over five inches tall. And um, it cuts well. It handles well. Not perfect, right? Like, I, 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 I am to design. I will make it a little bit thicker at the base. But even so, they they have a degree of distal taper. They they have something to ensure the mass distribution to make it wieldable. It's, it's actually better than wieldable. It's, it weighs four and a half pounds, right? So that's pretty light for for five feet tall sword, which is why I rated them. You know, tier C, because you got like vastly different. I, if I am to handle the the one Kyle review, the um the OTC one, I probably rate it tier B. So there you go, like tier D and F, and then tier C, tier B. So you probably like you combine their experiences, probably results in a tier C. So that that one is like a outlier. Like it really surprised me. I I, I rarely got. A surprise because I do my homework, right? When I, whether I buy my sword or if I ask a manufacturer, I expect to like them, right? I don't expect to to hate them. So, yeah. For me, it would be the this cold steel hand in half. I did not really expect to like it, and the initial handling of it is. It feels a little clunky, but the more you use it, the more the more I use it, the more I appreciate it. Still counts, Matt. Sorry to cut you off. <laughs> I've actually heard really, really good things about the cold steel hand and a half for a budget cutter. So people take it to competition cuttings. I think there was a one at the final of Long Point 2016. There's guy well, just Philip everyone else is using competition cutting with. Philip Martin should only yeah. be allowed to compete with the spatula. Yeah. Or with what you're, <laughs> no, with what you're holding right there. I want to see him cut the Tommy with that. Yeah, and he'd take silver and we'd all be annoyed. Is that a miniature by, I know that. Um, it is not a mini katana. No, sir. It is a letter opener. That is, you know, honestly, the mini katana, mini katanas are actually kind of fun. They're They're like big versions of this. This is a mini, mini, mini -er. anyway. Uh, no, but you were all looking cool, so I thought, you know. 
The main trying to be as cool as Kane, and I'm failing constantly. Yeah, Kane's got like respect for that forearm strength, just holding it for. A He's been doing it the whole three and a half time. hours. Serious? Do you get the three and a half hour? The, the <laughs> yeah. like, seriously. I'm trying to give him the this weather the look. Gym. Watched your tier video, and you're like, I just got back from the gym, and I was like, Of course you fucking did. I was like, I'm gonna go do some push-ups right now. <laughs> That uh, mini katana is it made of a carbon steel or is it like stainless steel? I don't know. Um, this is like an old letter opener, but it has like a well formed hibaki and like a, I don't know. It's just on my pile of random little swords that I get because as a sword person, people are like I saw this thing that looked like a sword and it was a dollar and I got it for you. That's that's what happens to me. So I have a a pile of also little swords. I had a, that are handy when you know large muscular gentlemen are flexing their swords. So I gotta I could break mine out and be cool too. Like I can <laughs> challenge accepted Kane. I can I can hold the sword for three hours too. Says the totally. guy who has <laughs> anybody on stream. <laughs> um all right, Vic, you uh Kyle shared some, some cool ones. What any any positive surprises for you before we close out? Uh, just in terms of like reviews and stuff like that. Yeah, um, just stuff that yeah. uh, you know we we talked at nauseum about irredeemable features of Hanshu. I I thought it would be more fun to not be like, all right, and good night. Like maybe. <laughs> I will. Yeah. So I will say again, the um, the Hanshu Italian sword has a really really pretty hologram blade on it, and that's something you really don't see a whole lot of in the sub three hundred dollar market. And uh, you know, wasn't perfect. You know, the, the central ridge wavered and it had hammer marks and all that, but that's to be expected. But it looked really, really, really good. And like, that's the sword that you take out of the scabbard and it just feels good despite being wrong in a lot of ways. So, yeah, I think if if their customer or not customer, if their um, quality control could be a little bit better, then that's a brand that would be really intriguing and is really intriguing to a lot of people. You know, John and I kind of debated on whether or not we should look into that brand because of some of their past issues. And we decided, Hey, you know, people are going to buy those swords. So we kind of owe it to the community to give an opinion if we can. So that's why we did that. And I think that's a good sword. Like there's a Viking sword that they make that I really, really like, and I'm probably going to check out, but quality control happens with some things like the uh, 1796 saber that I just got had quality control issues and I had to send it back. So, you know, that can happen sometimes even from makers that have been around a minute, but yeah, uh, pleasantly surprised though, I will say, I don't know if it's a Chinese sword, so completely off topic, but uh, I have a Dao from Iron Tiger Forge. That was $220, and that is one of the most fun swords that I have. So sometimes there are diamonds in the rough out there, and sometimes you can find a budget sword that looks good, cuts really, really well, and you'll be very happy with it, so yeah. It's oh, just a strangely I... mounted falchion. That's that's really all. Literally a falchion. In the yeah. European realm. But the, Actually, the, the grip I, have, curve, I call it my Doku sword because it looks like Count Doku's lightsaber. So, <laughs> so what were you going to say, Ken? Actually, it inspired me. That the real surprise I had is that uh, a Ryan sword, Glamdry, that I got from um, her friend Matt, the same, mm. the same, same one sent a bunch to um, Matt here to, to dis destroy. He said, sell me that sword for like 60 bucks or so. And it was a, it was a joy to cut with. You know, it handles really well. And, and there, is, there are some problems with the hilt. You know, the material they use for for pummel or so. I don't know what that is. Is that like a zinc alloy or stainless steel? But they, mm -hmm. they handle really well. It cuts like beautifully and handles well. And you know, it just, yeah. Definitely, you know, for 60 bucks, you can't, can't hope for anything better. Yeah. Also, um, and this sword's a lot more expensive, back to European stuff, the Hanwei Kawit sword, that is a fantastic sword. Like, I, I'm really, really impressed with that thing. Sorry, which model? The Hanwei uh, Kawit sword. Oh, Kawit, yeah. Yeah, I think you have that, don't you? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. that's awesome. a really impressive sword for the money. But can you hold it for three hours? <laughs> Challenge accepted. Yeah, you just opened up a can of worms because you're just going to get a video of me doing this like the whole time. You're welcome, Matt. <laughs> really? Kane's got the three-hour sword hold challenge going. That's that's a... <laughs> yeah, that's going to be a thing. Gonna yeah, I got to show you this before we close out. Like, 
<laughs> but we put it down. If, if you are looking yeah, for a good budget, no this is a Hanway Albrecht II is a great budget. Remember Hanway. this? Yeah, Kyle, you just got that back, didn't you? Like you sold it and then got a new one? Yes. Oh, what's that? That's the uh, uh, Qi Gen. Chu Chu Gen? Chu Gen? Yeah. No. Qi Gen. Yeah. Qi Gen. Yeah, the. Do you, one... you got one yourself, Kane, eh? Yeah, I got from uh, Thorf and Daniel. The ones send you the uh, type 18 sleeve. <laughs> per it's your a... recommendation. That that you know that's uh that's just uh that's an arming sword because we're keeping it European here, um, <laughs> but the uh yeah that that was definitely one. There's been a number of swords over over time that have uh kind of floored me and made me question myself, but that is a great example of one, Kane, because I remember seeing the uh, when Hanway released it and they put this nice video out about it, and I was like, that's dumb, and moved on with my life and didn't give it a thought. And then they came up for sale. They went out, like, on discontinued and, like, were, like, a few hundred dollars, I think. And then I happened to get one, like, thrown in a bundle of swords, basically, that I bought. I wasn't expecting much from it, and I picked it up, and I was like, that's fucking awesome. <laughs> also, uh, yeah, so that... That's one of those things. That was definitely one that I thought was stupid, and then I got it, and I was like, "This is really cool." Yeah. Did you guys talk about the uh, Todd Cutler sword, or excuse me, Todd Cutler swords? I was before? going to bring them up. That you're the only <laughs> How one much of the third has experience. Wow. Hey, you know what, Matt? You live your own life. How about that? No, no. <laughs> but I'll stay in my lane, buddy. <laughs> the, uh, we we didn't we didn't talk about Todd Cutler. I don't have any. I haven't had one. I would like to, but I haven't, I really haven't played with uh, much of any of his stuff. But Kyle and Kane both gave high praise. Yeah, but uh, I, so I recently got a couple of uh, the daggers from Todd Cutler. I got the 14th century Kulion and the Twisted Rondell dagger, which are both Those really, are really good. Yeah, I think you got them both. Um, not like I watched your reviews and decided to buy them or anything. Uh, <laughs> but um, I have the Messer. The uh, Gross's Messer from Todd Cutler. And John has the Type 14 Army Sword that reviews filmed and will be coming out shortly. And uh, while after shipping and everything, they're, you know, about 800 US dollars out the door. So they're not inexpensive. Do you think they're really, really good quality? Um, I really, really like this one. Blade's really good, despite it having a, you know, a finish and a grind that some people might not like. But you pick this up and it handles beautifully the army sword even more so i think i'm even more impressed with that thing that feels like a beast but like an agile beast and it's really well done it's got you get really really well made scabbards with like whatever sword that you buy and like even though they're not mid-range well upper mid-range they're not you know budget swords like i still think they're really really intriguing swords on the market so like this bad boy, it's pretty nice. This one, I was actually going to reach out to you, Matt, and see how busy you were, because like you've unofficially become the messer guy um, with all the messers you've gotten. So if you were interested, I would send this to you for review. But um, yeah, I, I'm, I've become a fan, and they recently uh, came out with a couple of new swords, including a Type One Falchion, yeah, which looks really, really interesting. It's something I might pick up at some time. So. I would uh, take you up on that uh, to to keep a well-rounded view of of Messers. I I do have to get through uh, the Lands Connect Emporium ones they sent my way. Yeah, but there there will be uh, you know, once I'm done it, with those, it's not going anywhere. So whenever you want it, let me know, and it'll it'll head your way. Sweet. But well, I really really like it. I think it's a it's a really good bang for buck in terms of something that's historical that just feels right when you pick it up. Um, there's lots of really good things about it. So. I'm glad we could end on a positive note because because uh, that that is good and I will I will hopefully get a chance to check that out. It will be fun, and I'm glad that Todd Cutler. I mean, it's not a surprise that somebody like Todd is behind making good things that people like. <laughs> He's he certainly he certainly seems to have an idea of what makes a good sword. So I'm I'm glad. I will not be coming out with my own lines of swords, though. So don't, you know, I don't know if any of you have aspirations that once you get to uh, half a million subscribers, you come up with your own sword line. But I, I don't think that's the 
<laughs> well, even if I did, I would not make it because I will, they're, they're, I'm not going to hit half a million subscribers. You, you say that, but, you know, then one day, who knows? Uh, yeah, but probably not. We, we are in a very niche niche group here. <laughs> probably not On the that case. note, I want to point out real quick, I'm not sure if he's still watching, but Andy from, was it Derelict Swords? How do you say it? Is that the the last he just broke a thousand subscribers today, if I'm not, if I'm not mistaken. So uh, right, that's Andy. freaking awesome. And if you're watching, congratulations, homie. That's sick. That's so, like, cheers to you, man. And everybody, if, you, if you're not a subscriber, check him out. Yeah, very yeah. knowledgeable, very informative, very good dude. So, and I probably should have invited him to the to the whole spiel thing. He's been popping off in the chat. He said he was busy tonight, though, as I was. But hey, well, you know, things happen. <laughs> things happen. Talk swords. <laughs> well, all right. Bourbon happens. Uh, uh, stick around, guys, for just a sec after we close. But uh, I'll I'll end the stream here. Thanks everyone for keeping chat lively. Uh, Kane, uh, Vic, Kyle, thank you for joining and and blabbering on for three and a half, three, three, three and three quarters hours of uh, sword shenanigans. It's been it's been a hoot. Uh, I'll link all the stuff in the description down below if you're still watching. And uh, thanks thanks everyone. Cheers. Cheers. Peace.